Maybe enough light to find stuff in but we're Well, I think of it like that there's my for the slides to go up from yeah. the that are all the deep production is we keep it up and then we'll turn it down. Yeah, we can turn it down when we get started. All right, well, appreciate everybody coming in. Um, definitely appreciate all the help from the Tall Timbers and Southern Fire Exchange at getting this set up. I know most everybody here, but uh, I did want to just kind of do some quick introductions as we go through. Uh, also, make sure everybody knows we've got snacks. There is some, some coffee. I, I, I will apologize for the strength of the coffee, but uh, I was <clears throat> feeling the need this morning, and uh, it had a, an option for strong, and it is. So uh, maybe that will keep things lively. Do you want to keep things real and informal? You know, it's a, a small group. Most everybody uh, knows everybody else. Um, real excited about what we're going to be presenting today, but this is, you know, not going to be us up here preaching. You know, this is showing some things that we have been working on where we're going to be seeking you know, guidance and input from you know, your different backgrounds and expertise on how we can make the next steps in this particular project even better. But uh, how many folks have we got uh, dialed in so far, David? We got three folks. Uh, three folks. Do you have the names yet? Not yet. Okay, well, we'll, we'll introduce folks online once we get them online, but I'll go ahead and start. Um, I'm James Furman, currently the U.S. Forest Service liaison for the Air Force Wildland Fire Branch. Uh, prior to that, was the FMO at Eglin Air Force Base for about 15 years, where I worked closely with uh, Brett and with Kevin Hires. And prior to that, I actually had 15 years with what was then the Florida Division of Forestry, as a forest area supervisor over in Blackwater, doing a lot of the burning on Blackwater River at State Forest. So uh, been involved with this grant since its inception, which was actually uh, me and Rod and Brett and Kevin sitting around what we call the round table there at Eglin. Uh, Kevin showed me some of what Rod had produced with the fire tech model and some interactions between flaming fronts. And I said, you know, this looks amazing and uh, put together a, a grant proposal and the rest is history. We've been working on it since about 2013 and starting to get some really fascinating results, I think you'll see. But uh, with that, I'll go ahead and uh, if you want to connect, Brett, and yeah. just do a round robin introductions. I'm Brett Williams. Uh, welcome. Appreciate y'all showing up today. I'm the current fire management officer at Eglin Air Force Base and uh, what they call a module lead. We've kind of reorganized uh, us in the Air Force and centralized, yeah, centralized wildland fire, but uh, it's formerly the fire ecologist at Eglin Air Force Base, which is kind of a unique uh, situation for the fire ecologist to be running the, the fire program now, but maybe a model I'd like to promote. Uh, yeah, I'm just happy to be a part of the project. Kind of feel privileged to have the you know, brain power of Rod and <coughs> some of the brain power and creativity of Kevin Myers and James. And happy to be here, so appreciate it. So I'm Rod Lynn. I work out in Los Alamos in New Mexico, and uh, welcome everybody, and we're looking for a lot of feedback here, looking to learn a lot today, or I am, at least, and I'm super excited to be supporting James and Brett on this part. Yeah, and, and, and Rod's being very humble, but Rod actually developed the fire tech program that we're going to be showcasing today, and it's the one that you know, has access to the supercomputers that all side of those that made this project possible. Would not be possible without Rob's help, but uh, you can enjoy the work without the computers. <laughs> <laughs> I am Greg, uh, Greg Solansky. Uh, I'm a zone fire management officer with the National Park Service on the Appalachian Piedmont Zone. So basically I cover north or eastern Tennessee, northern Georgia, the whole state of North Carolina, and the whole state of South Carolina for park service units. So I have a very large range, a lot of different variabilities in fuels and fire, both prescribed fire and non fire. <clears throat> you may have heard my name in relation to a little fire that we had a couple of years ago called the Chimney Tops 2 fire. <coughs> that was my fire, or part of it. There's a lot of other aspects involved. So I've become the 
living the way they're going to find. <laughs> but we're not, we're not going to whip them. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. they might be. But yeah, it might be what you've heard the name. But I was former Forest Service. I worked 14 years on the Cherokee National Forest. And it was just recently 10 months with the Park Service before that happened. So it's been two years with the Park Service since that. So they can't blame you for all the fuel bills up in the way. No. <laughs> but, yeah. Really glad to have the Park Service here. Yeah. Too. Uh, good morning, uh, John Sadler with the Florida Forest Service, um, prescribed fire manager. Uh, basically, I run our certified prescribed burner program. So, glad to be here. So, is uh, John Fish going to make it? No, John, uh, he had a personal matter. He got a 10 big day. So. Okay, John. He said he might. He yeah. It. He let me take his truck, though. Which is kind of <laughs> 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 yeah, the break will go out and play with his <laughs> he gets mad when you do that. Hi, I'm Jennifer Anderson. I'm the fire planner for the National Forest in Florida. Just got back in December. I've been out in California for the last three years. Don't hold that against me. Because um, I was in Florida before I went out there. I was mm -hmm. at Everglades as a field specialist and kind of worked all over the southeast and various um, agencies and positions. But um, got involved, real heavily involved with fire modeling up there. So, um, so I'm really interested in what you have going on. Kevin Hires, Wildland Fire Scientist here at Tell Timbers. I spent a uh, you know, number of years at England with uh, Brett and James. Um, in 2005, I saw my first fire tech output, and I said, oh my God, that's the future. And I was immediately told by folks in Missoula at the fire center that this can never be operational. And you know, I, I absolutely and vehemently, Kevin, vehemently, dis yeah. vehemently <laughs> disagree. And you know, these next generation tools are today's generation tools. And I think that what we're about to see is a great way of visualizing management applications from something that, that may have a little bit longer planning horizon in the next burn period. But I'm really looking forward to the, the creativity in, in, in this group thinking about how we can apply them. And the ones that run in real time are not too far behind. So this is this is really exciting. Moment. Yeah, I, I think this is really a glimpse into what operational you know, daily planning fire models may be for ten years from now. Ten years from now, James, what will we be doing? <laughs> I'm Steve Miller. I serve the St. Johns River Water Management District as the chief of land resources, which means I'm in charge of the land management and fire programs for the district. You know, and then you're also. Secretary for the International Association of Wildland Fire, right? I, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. My name is Kevin Spear. I'm a <coughs> professor at Florida State University um, and director of the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab there. So my, my involvement here is, is a little bit as a newcomer. Uh, we have had students over the years that have been associated particularly with ROD and, and with the uh, building the, the, and improving the fire tech model. And I've seen that for many years, uh, but, uh, but it wasn't until I became director about three or four years ago that I, that I wanted to get this going again, and now we have a nascent uh, fire dynamics program there, and uh, several students in that program up and coming. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I'm glad you make it today. Uh, my name is David Godwin, and I'm the coordinator for the Southern Fire Exchange, which you guys uh, are aware. And uh, our program works to connect uh, fire managers across the southeast with the latest wildland fire science research information. So projects like this uh, and connecting the, the relevant results with those managers is right in line with the kind of things that we were working on. And David has done almost all of the heavy lifting getting things set up and truly appreciate it. Yep. Works for the fire uh, Kevin Robertson, I'm the Fire Ecology Program Director here at Tall Timbers, and just wanted to learn more about fire tech. I've had a lot of, you know, looked at a lot of cool videos, but like wanted to learn a little, a little deeper, get into it. <laughs> See what that on. Good morning, I'm Carl Patrick. I'm the Forest Supervisor for the National Forest of Alabama. I'm also on the Joint Fire Science uh, Program Board, Governor's Board, and um, so. Struggling right now with the future of that program with reduced funding and stuff. So, uh, very interested in fire, have a strong fire background uh, before moving into Upper Med. And then Carl actually worked at Aiden when I first got there in 1998. <coughs> we, we, we tried a few year courses together. We did. 
They're mm -hmm. weird. Saw a few fires. Um, did want to <coughs> bring your attention to the the packets that I've given everybody. There's uh, some information here that uh, might find useful. I've got a a flyer that was developed early on that gives a little more background on kind of how the project was set up, you know, the, the planning that went into generating the videos that you'll see. And I do have more copies of that if anybody wants any to, to take back. Of course, we've got the agenda of to have a, a hard copy of the presentation with the notes pages and we purposely put notes in here that would be useful to you folks that are attending. And I would encourage you to you know, take notes as you go through because when we do the facilitate part where we're discussing we'll flip back to this and we can refer to you know, slide number nine or slide number 15 if, if one that we want to discuss further and pull back up. So I encourage you to, to take notes as you go along. And uh, also the, we have feedback uh, questions that we'll cover as the, the second part of the, the workshop as we can go through the visualization part of it and the background information and then the evaluation. And there's also a list of references in the back of just a number of different publications that have done on biotech and the, the process. So just want to let you know what's in there so that you can uh, utilize that when we go through. Um, James, from, from what I understand, David will be uh, posting this to YouTube yep. the entire workshop. So. Yeah, and we, we do have a few folks that are uh, dialed in remotely, we would be able to see the slides and, and hear the discussion that's in here. And they've got a, a chat box that they can uh, correspond with and ask questions <coughs> as well. And if, if, if you've got ideas on how we can help to keep them engaged, especially once you learn. Yeah, we have, uh, so far we have Curtis Bryant and Tommy Patane, and they're both with DOD at Fort Stewart, Georgia. Okay, great. They join us remotely. And uh, Bill Hyatt uh, has joined us also, and he's a Resource conservationist in uh, Nebraska. All right, well, great. Oh, Nebraska. Yeah, well, uh, definitely appreciate uh, those folks that are not dialing in remotely. Um, you know, with that, we'll go ahead and, and uh, get started with just a few introductory slides that I'll be doing before I, I pass things on. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the objectives of the workshop. And one of the objectives that's not explicitly stated here is, you know, we want to keep this very uh, informal. Uh, you know, I hope that we can get a lot of discussion going as we go through. If you've got the questions you know, at any time, just feel free to, to raise your hand and, uh, and we'll go through it. But, you know, first we want to expose you know, the, the attendees to these you know, fire simulations that we're doing with fire tech. You know, enhancing your understanding of product goals, kind of how we got to, to where we are, and also want to talk about the potential for improving prescribed fire training and outcomes using the uh, fire tech tool and these simulations. But we're going to be uh, asking for feedback, both informally and a little bit more formally uh, in the latter part of the, the workshop and you'll be thinking about how these things would apply in the organization that you're involved with because you know the needs for folks in the forest service might be somewhat different than the park service or uh, the state of nebraska or uh, the state agency so be thinking about uh, how those things can can work best for your organization as we go through uh, you know, obviously we're going to be looking at sort of you know, what i consider the point of the spear for uh, prescribed fire modeling you know, with these fire tech runs we've been doing and also just enhancing that collaboration and cross-pollination between fire managers and the research community. You know, that's one of the things that you know really excites me about this project is that you know, we as, as managers have been involved from the very get-go to make sure that it, it, it gets at questions that, that we had you know, as we were managing fires at Edwin. You uh, speak to kind of the purpose of this workshop to build yeah. uh, future workshops? Yeah, and so this is the first of the <coughs> plan workshops. Uh, this one, we're gathering information 
and from you guys as you know, leaders in your organizations so that we can fine tune the next workshops that are going to be geared towards practitioners. And we, you know, the plan is to have a traveling road show uh, where we go out to areas where there's a lot of prescribed burning being done, you know, preferably in you know, large you know, interagency type areas, you know, probably some DOD installations you know, that are uh, close. Hopefully we go to Fort Stewart if we can do that, uh, and maybe Camp Virginia and some different places. But the next workshops will be you know, geared more towards practitioners and things that will actually be we think useful for them in accelerating the learning curve and improving so, so uh, the focus, <clears throat> you know, we're going to be showing you, you know, what fire tech can do, which is you know, some pretty amazing things. But you know, we're exploring its sensitivities, looking at different fuel structure, you know, how it reacts to you know, grass versus you know, trees with mid-story, different emission techniques and different wind speeds, after looking at five mile an hour wind speeds, 12 mile an hour wind speeds, kind of you know, within that range that most prescribed fires in southeastern U.S. are taking place. And kind of wanted to look at, at the two ends. And um, you know, we developed these different simulations based on real world, world questions that we had as fire managers at Ed. You know, we were starting to do you know, you know, a lot of aerial ignition, but also looking at different lengths of ashes and different uh, ways of igniting things. Um, and then disseminating the results. There is a large outreach component to the, the grant, and we're really getting into that part of it with this workshop being the you know, first really big thing out of a few presentations that we've done at some you know, different you know, conferences and that sort of thing. So, you know, the bottom line is that we want to accelerate learning and we want to do the best that we can to improve prescribed fire outcomes using uh, the fire tech. And uh, we really hope to get uh, input from all the on how to make that happen. <clears throat> so the problem that is being addressed with this project is that, you know, Lifmas, you know, Farsight, you know, these other fire models that are used operationally, you know, they don't take into account you know, influences, um, you know, the coupled atmospheric the influences, you know, thermal lift, in drafts. You're know, there for a single point source. They're for a single point source <clears throat> that spreads in a single direction and you know, it doesn't interact with, with other fires. So you know, they don't do that. Prescribed burning relies on that. The way that prescribed burns are planned and carried out, you know, a burn boss is looking at trying to take advantage of those interactions. So there just hasn't been a tool out there that is able to do that. And by people not understanding that, not having good visual tools, you know, just you know, makes the learning curve tougher. You know, one of the things that I say is, you know, part of the, you know, my goal of being involved in this project is to keep new burners that are coming up from having to make all the same mistakes that I made when I was coming up and, you know, learning by you know, blowing the canopy out of the top, uh, somewhere where the fire draws into the middle that you hadn't thought about it because you didn't understand how these things work. But, uh, you know, lines of fire interact. And, you know, that's just a, a fact of life, you know, illustrated by the, you know, these two lines of fire, which is on the RX cadre burns, once they get to a certain closeness, then they will pull together. And so, you know, that's the kind of thing that we'll be uh, looking more closely at as we move through the slides. So, uh, with that, I will turn it over to Rod, who's going to give a little more background information on fire tech itself and what it does. <coughs> So James, do the other movies on the slide play or not? No, the other movies do not play. Wow. So, so, uh, so first of all, let's just say that FireTech is still a work in progress. Okay, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a computer simulation tool that's been evolving for a number of years now. 
but is still on. So not only are we looking for input on the ways to use it and ways to get the point, points across, but also we're very open to somebody saying, you know, that's not capturing what I see in the field. So I think that's that's a message that we will continue to put out there. This is not a it's not a finished product, and it shouldn't be viewed as something that that is stagnant. So we're always looking for understanding better better about what is not being captured. So FireTech is actually what we're calling FireTech is actually a merger between a fire behavior. Uh, module and a and an atmospheric hydrodynamics or atmospheric fluid dynamics model, which is called Hydra. And Hydra has been developed over uh, the last two decades at Los Alamos based on applications to a variety of different problems. Uh, these include everything. I apologize if the movies aren't working. Everything from wind turbine. Uh, Interactions between the blades and the atmosphere themselves, to <coughs> wake dynamics, to plume dynamics, to working on some uh, NASA uh, catastrophic shuttle accident scenarios and looking where, where uh, HCL plumes might go if the shuttle were to uh, have a problem, say 15 seconds after liftoff. How do, how do you get people off of a NASA causeway? Or do you, do you, do you have to put off your launch, etc.? Uh, hurricane intensification, urban flow problems, etc. So, all these different problems, you say, well, that's not wildfire. How is that related? Those all drive increasingly high fidelity modeling to the point where high grad incorporates a lot of physics that is super relevant to wildfires. And so, the way that, that we all got into this was thinking about. Um, how much of fire behavior depends on the motion of the atmosphere around it. And, and the ambient wind on fires has been captured for a long time in a variety of different models, in most, most wildfire models, but the feedback from the fire on the atmosphere and how that's a dynamic self-adjusting process is really critical. And it becomes even more critical, as James said, in the context of prescribed fire. Because now you're actually out there engineering the way that fire is going to interact with your ecology to meet your objectives and uh, avoid unwanted consequences of that fire. You're engineering that on the fly by adjusting the interaction between the fires. So this is all couple fire atmosphere interaction that, that became the, the root of, of what, we, what we want to accomplish with fire. So, uh, so this notion of coupled fire atmosphere interaction is, is accomplished by, by backing up another step and saying what are the basic phenomena or processes that drive wildfires. Okay, you've got a combustion process, you've got the heat release from the combustion, you've got the exchange of energy from the gases to the solids and back from the solids to the gases. You've got things like the aerodynamic drag that the vegetation is causing itself. It's not the fuel that we think about on the landscape. It's not just providing things to burn. It's also changing the wind field around the, around the fire itself. The presence of a canopy has multiple effects on a fire, and it's not just limited to adding combustibles. So putting those things into a tool that interacts, has direct interaction between the fire and the fuels in the atmosphere uh, involves putting them in a three-dimensional mesh so we got a large volume. Let's just say a volume that might be a kilometer by a kilometer by half a kilometer high. And taking that volume and breaking it into cells that might be a couple meters on the side. And in each one of those cells, as depicted on the picture on the right, capturing what's in there in terms of the gas field. So what temperature is the gases that are flowing through that volume? What is the velocity of those gases? But also, how much 
Uh, how much vegetation is there? How much combustible material? How much material that's causing a decrease in the wind speed is present in each one of those cells? And I've only got a single point of cell, but think of this as being a full volume throughout a domain. And then within, within each of those cells, capturing those interacting processes between uh, the solids and gases. So one of the things that this allows us to do is get away from some of the paradigms that have gone, that have guided fire behavior models in the past. So the movie that you picture up that's, that's on the right here, let me describe that before I go back up to the top of the slide. This, there's a plane aligned with the white line, and the fire is moving towards it. And so the vectors that you're going to see, just as colors more or less, are showing the wind dynamics that is caused by that fire as it approaches the line. So right now you're looking at the wind dynamics before the fire gets to that plane. And so the colors, red means that the winds are coming out at you. Blues mean that they're being sucked back in towards the fire, because currently the fire is behind it. So this is the wind that's happening downstream of the fire line. Okay, as the fire approaches that plane, this is the wind, the change in that wind dynamics just caused before the fire even got there. Now this is the this is the wind field as the fire gets close. And the thing that I don't know why it stopped, but <coughs> maybe it'll start back up. <laughs> and it, anyway, it's actually a nice place to stop. So <laughs> the fact that that you've got some places where the wind is poking up and some places where the wind is going down, those troughs, those places where the wind is poking down is actually how the energy is being moved to the fuels in front of the fire. This idea that, that fire is moving as a wall of flame, this is not a wall of flame. And it's actually the gaps between these towers that are likely moving the most energy to the unburned fuel in front of the fire. You get these towers that show up, moving energy upward, but the gaps between them are moving energy down on the air. So the way this shows up is you've got some, some vorticity or some rotating motion of the air as it comes from behind. I'm going to back up and just come back at this again. Hopefully we haven't just crashed the laptop. Um, so the colors on the horizontal plane here, those are convective heat exchange. That's, that's the heat transfer by hot air moving over cold fuel. That's the, this, the red parts, which are even hard to see because they're happening right in front of the fire. Or cold air moving over warmer fuel. So that's why the blue, the blue is areas where the fire's already heated that fuel up and it's being cooled by the air coming in from behind the fire. So once again, blue colors in this on the plane of vectors mean the wind is getting sucked back towards the fire, and greens are in plane, so they're just kind of vertical motions, and then yellows and or greens, greens, yellows and reds are flow coming out at you. So, um, these towers and troughs, okay, we're just going to call that done then. <laughs> they, they continue as the fire, they continue to grow, grow in amplitude as the fire goes along. So Rod, what is what, this Rod, what's the vertical scale in, in, that, in that image, <coughs> roughly? So I'm going to say this is probably about 60 meters. Six, 60? 60, 60. Uh, the domain goes up to 600 meters, but I've cut the... The box is not the whole domain. Actually, no, that's probably not right. This is probably about 30, just based on how many lines we have here. Um, so what does this, this approach let us do? So because you're capturing the, the buoyant release from the fire, and you're capturing the atmosphere's response to that buoyant, to that energy release, we start to be able to back up and say, okay, well, how do different fire lines interact? And this is some work that was done by Jean-Luc Dupuis in France using this tool where he was simulating some, a, an experiment that was done to look at the interaction between two fire lines. 
uh, that was actually done in Spain. And so the idea here was to look at, you know, when do they start, when do the wind fields start to interact and when do they start to merge and when do you get, um, when do you get them drawing together? And then you could do sensitivity analysis to see, well, if I keep separating them, when do they act independently and when are they, when are they, um, when are they pulling together as you might get on a backfiring situation? So we felt like that was a really important piece of the puzzle when we start looking at prescribed fire. Because obviously prescribed fire, a lot of what the practitioners are doing is using fire to affect other lines of fire. So I'll James all, or Brett. Yep. <coughs> First, I mean, I've got to follow the physicist. <laughs> and uh, again, really informal, and uh, I'm going to rely on Rod to ensure that I don't uh, misrepresent <laughs> his modeling efforts. So we're just going to run through uh, some of the, just a selection of the simulations uh, that, that Rod's run for us there. And uh, some of it's still shots, some of it's video, but uh, one purpose of this is to show you some of the phenomenology of interacting fire lines, different ignition techniques, search tra tactics, but also to get your feedback on which visuals are the most uh, interesting, most useful. So kind of think about that as we go along, um, you know, a little bit of the phenomenology, but also it, it feedback on the visuals. So this is one of the early uh, fire tech runs we did. Uh, we looked at two different wind speeds, again, 20-foot winds at 5 miles per hour and 20-foot uh, winds at 12 miles per hour. Uh, three different forest structures, just grass uh, fuels, grass with canopy added, and we, uh, we built the fuel beds using monitoring data at Eglin Air Force Base in our sand hills. This is a uh, I think there were two different plots, one that was fairly fire maintained and one that had more of a developed uh, mid-story, uh, mostly turkey oak, persimmon uh, mid-story. So we just added trees in one uh, fuel bed and uh, <coughs> a canopy with mid-story. So really interested adding the mid-story on what kind of uh, oh, aerodynamic drag that would uh, uh, cause or the influence of the mid-story on fire behavior. So some obvious things jump out here, uh, obviously lower wind speeds, and, and I guess all this was at, uh, taken at a 250 second timestamp. Mm -hmm. So you can see the effect, obviously, of wind. Um, and again, the ignition would have started at the bottom and uh, just a single line of ignition, strip head fire uh, from bottom to top. So obviously wind and grass, uh, fairly obvious. You add canopy and you start getting some drag. It's not really obvious, but uh, some uh, <coughs> slowing of rate of spread or decreased rate of spread. Uh, this is adding mid-story. You start getting a little more uh, rate of spread reduction. And then we started adding multiple lines of ignition, multiple strip head fires, multiple lighters, uh, uh, either walking or on ATVs, however you you would ignite the unit. I believe this was using ATVs just to speed up the, uh, the uh, model run. <clears throat> and you can start seeing, uh, again, colors, or I should back up really quick, colors on these, uh, obviously the green dots are the canopies of individual pine, pine trees, long we find. Uh, the brown underneath is the ground cover or uh, surface fuels. And then you'll start seeing some brown and black. Uh, the black is uh, mass loss or consumption of the canopy rod. So, is that yeah. good enough? Uh, so you'll start seeing a little more of the dark colors as you get multiple lines of ignition, uh, which is another nice uh, feature of fire tech. It can simulate the mass loss based on the heat. And so you can start getting to uh, at least a relative understanding of potential impacts to the canopy from, from the heat. Do you have a question back there, Steve? Yes, sir. Um, so the mid-story in this case is acting as a drag, but not necessarily as a fuel source, right? It's both. It's both. So it is actually, okay. And we'll, we'll get to more of the uh, oh, parameters that were fed into FireTech. This is a, uh, based on kind of a two-year time since burn. 
we'll get into the fuel loading and so forth. So, so fairly light rough, basically. But I think if you if you look at the difference between the, the canopy and where you've got the mid story, you know, <coughs> conditions other than the fuels, and you can actually see the, the darker spots where there is more intensity, you know, where you've got that mid story. And, and you know, we've got some information on what we use for fuel moistures and that sort of thing, but there's lots of volatility in the mid-story. So one of the things that's, that's a little bit different between FireTech and a lot of the other models is there's no rule built into FireTech that says fire will spread this fast. Fire will, you know, under under five meters, five mile per hour winds, you'll get this spread rate. There's, there's no rule built into fire tech that, that says that. There's also no, so, so the fact that it gets an acceleration, you know, as you increase the wind speed, everybody's like, well, that, that should happen. That's pretty obvious. But it's nice, I mean, but, but the, the big difference there is that's coming because the underlying processes are all giving you that net result, as opposed to pre-programming, this should be your answer. So that's, one point. The other one is same thing with fuels. Just because of mid store fuels there doesn't mean they sh they will burn, and that depends on the moisture levels and, and heat transfer to them at that given location and that. So the the trees around that clump of, of turkey oak will influence whether it burns or not, for instance. So so it's it's a little bit different paradigm, which is also why it's significantly more computationally expensive. And you're not going to run it on your iPad tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Steve, I think um, as we're going through these, I'd, I'd be curious to get your opinion on this too. But you know, you can in FireTech, you can sort of take the leaf biomass and leave it on. You can make it live. You can leave it on and let it be dead, frost killed up top, and and that just by prescribing the moisture content and the and the where those leaves are at a particular time of year, you get different outcomes. And I, I think that that was one of the real eye openers for me is to. Is to think about the leaf off condition, you know, during our winter simulations that you'll see it a bit, you know, that that then it's just a little bit of drag just from the stems, but it's not going to be contributing per se unless we left the vegetation of those leaves up high. And so it's uh, it's pretty neat in the level of detail that you can that you can put in there. Yeah, and we obviously have a limited uh, set of parameters that we were. We kind of had to limit, we had, we had a thousand questions, a thousand things we wanted to look at, but we kind of had to narrow in on a few factors. And so that's one thing to keep, make a list of things, man, it would have been neat if you did this, or what about trying this? Um, not that we'll have time within this project to do all that, but it could build on future projects or help us improve, or for Rod, some different directions he may want to go. A lot more questions than answers still, let's say. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, the uh, the multiple lines. What's the distance between those lines? Uh, approximately 150 feet. Yeah. And again, we could have chose 100 feet. We could have chose 300 feet. Yeah, we, we tried to base these on you know, places that are doing large scale ignitions and you know production burning like. The Everglades and the Appalachian Coals and the Fort Stewart's and you know, those places. And if you've got to make hay, and that's why you know, we did it with ATVs rather than you know by hand. You know, but the the fuels are you know generally what you have in sand hills. That's what we had the, the data for. You know, there's a lot of interest in you know, long length pine conservation, so we thought that's good. And that five mile an hour and twelve mile an hour wind are kind of the lower enough the threshold that probably 80% of your prescribed burns <coughs> take place in. So we wanted to, we, we built it to try and uh, be as useful to you know, prescribe by the community as we can, but yeah, it's very limited. Yeah, because you can go crazy with different variables, and, but we had to have something where we could you know, keep it comparable and generate some data that would be useful. So what's the, the take home message on the multiple lines in the level of consumption between five and 12 mile an hour winds? We'll actually get into some of the data on that. Uh, just a little bit. <coughs> it's hard to tell just from a visual. Uh, what, you can see a little bit of more dark modeling in here. The 
it indicates canopy loss or in general, canopy consumption? In general, multiple lines that simultaneously produce higher consumption. And I mean, you could play with all sorts of things here. Obviously, we just had to, uh, or what we, for simplicity, we had uh, everything was equally spaced, equal rates of ignition. You could uh, play with delayed, uh, delayed ignition between lighters, uh, different rates of ignition, um, different distances. Different staggers. Different, different staggers, so, yeah. So one of the, the points where, I mean, this was where I was, well, I'm, I'm in a continual state of getting educated on this stuff. But uh, in the later things, what you'll see is there's an obvious problem with these burns. You can never do the burns like this in the, in the field because there's no black line <laughs> downstream. So, um, so, so this was this was an exploration thing, but putting black lines in, or putting boundaries in, you should see is something certainly that can be dialed in. Or One of the things that's kind of been my experience, and maybe somewhat counterintuitive, is that with the higher velocity winds, using strip head fire, fairly close, you know, 30, 40 yards, um, but a lot of times that heat is blowing so fast on the floor it keeps the, the heat that it's not going up into the canopy. So the effect to the pine trees and, and yeah. scorch seems to be a lot yeah. more reduced. Yeah. And we actually talked some about that when we were designing them, but it's generally higher than 12 mile an hour winds where that occurs. Yes, yeah. same thing. Yeah. Because yeah. either 12 mile an hour, Four uh, 10 feet, 20 feet above the, or 20 feet above the canopy. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, sometimes we were burning in those low um, density fuels. We needed some higher winds, and that's probably right. Yeah. So I guess you could model crown scorch, I mean, short of crown combustion, if you wanted to. I mean, by knowing how much heat was absorbed by the yeah, if you, crown, I guess. I mean, Kevin and I were talking about that yesterday. If, if, you, if you understand what, I think there's, there's still some unknowns about how much heat does it take to scorch it's a little bit more of a fuzzy, a fuzzy line, but but how much heat does it take for how long? Temperatures for how long or how much heat does it take to actually scorch a needle? But yeah, you you can you can monitor how much heat is deposited on needles at any strata on any tree. Mm -hmm. I mean, any one of those computational cells, you're you're measuring the heat deposition on the foliage that's there. So you can you can look. Develop, that's a very important management objective, of course. You know, forest geography. Be nice if you could tweak it you know, for the areas. I mean, consider just in the short geographic distance between Eglin and Blackwater. Tree height in Blackwater is much higher. You know, the ground cover is much different with wire grass. Tree, you know, canopy height is 55 feet at Eglin, you know, but not as much wire grass. So all those things are going to be different in different places. So the degree that you can kind of tweak it for your area is so I think, pretty and, powerful. I, I think. think Brett will describe that piece of it here in a minute, but the, the truth is the fuel bed you see here has all the trees. I don't know how many trees we actually have here, but there's a huge, there's a, there's a variation in all the, in the trees that was based on site-specific data. Yeah, we used monitoring plots, and uh, we, in our monitoring plots, we tagged every tree, GPS them, and so we took that plot and kind of extrapolated across the landscape, or within the modeling domain, I guess. Yeah, if there were 100 tagged trees, we used those 100 trees replicated randomly in random arrangements around the landscape, so there's similar I, I think in answer to uh, the taking Carl's uh, comment a step further, you know, there's so many variables, like I say, black water is a lot different, I mean, even on the egg on the east side versus the west side is different. Really. You know, and the discussion we had is we want to focus on the general phenomenology, those things that are going to be common based on ignition. If you've got fuels that will carry and you've got overstory and midstory, you know, looking at those differences, things that should be very similar between the Blackwaters and the Eglins or even potentially similar to Ponderosa Pine in the West where you've got you know, grass and needles in the understory and 
but that general phenomenology rather than exactly what the yeah we don't have be. any dreams of being able to come in in the morning plant a burn run this and say oh that's what it's going to do <laughs> i mean yeah. that might you might get close but it's more to get practitioners to think about this is what happens when strip heads come together or uh, point sources come together or those kind of phenomena that james is saying but i think it's really important what what i hear carl saying is is right on we've discussed this there's got to be some way of representing you know, the contour within the forest. You got the 3D fuels, the fire behavior, the phenomenology is great, but you have to be able to represent some objective estimate of scorch. Whether or not it is or not, it's it's fine, but if it's a hundred degree, you know, Celsius contour in that stand, the count, you know, that shows how well y'all are counting for, you know, convective cooling, those cool in drafts, or heat, you know, venting out. I think that that'd be a, a great way to do it. And, and then, then, you know, if you're modeling a 100-foot canopy or a fit, you know, 75-foot canopy or 50-foot canopy, you've got like an objective, you know, scorch index. And, and we can discuss some of the science of scorch, and that's, that's where we really don't know exactly, um, you know, what, what kills a tree. There's a lot of uh, published uh, data that, that actually just references this, this idea of 60 degrees Celsius, but it's mostly based on water bath that, uh, experiments. So I'm, I'm thinking maybe something 80, 90, 100 degrees, a contour where you can zoom in to that, that, that canopy would be interesting to me. The other question I have is what about terrain? Is this pretty much for like relatively flat coastal yeah, plain forest? This is done with, yeah, completely flat. FireTech can do terrain, but that would have just been another complicating factor for trying to do it. Try to reduce our variables. <laughs> yes. So for the purposes of applications outside this project, we've done a lot of stuff on terrain and looked at the influences of, of complex, complex terrain and simple terrain. But on this project, because it is focused on Eglin, and although Eglin is not flat, um, we across the it is flat just for the project. Yeah, we have to just simplify on a lot of things. But if you had a DRM or LIDAR data or something, it could, could be. David, you could. <coughs> for the recording and for some of our remote folks, could you talk about the tree species and plant species that are included in your model, your full model, and the that you did the runs on? Yeah, I mean, uh, not everybody's familiar with can it. The, the canopy overstory is pretty much completely long leaf pine. Um, and then the mid-story is a mix of longleaf uh, saplings, <coughs> mainly turkey oak, a few other scrub oaks, and persimmon. We just kind of simplified the mid-story. And again, it's a fairly simple mid-story in this, this monitoring plot. It's fire maintained. Um, and then the ground cover, we didn't get real specific as far as species. It's kind of a mix of grass, mainly grass, I would say. Yeah, I don't know if we even sure. added any forbs into the ground cover, I think it's pure grass, yeah, it's grass just to simplify. Pine straw, maybe. It's a very simplistic fuel bed, fuel forest structure, and, and Carl brings a good point, is uh, that's one, I don't know if it'd be a challenge, but you've got to have some data to be able to build a fuel bed, or you just have to create a kind of artificial fuel bed uh, within FireTech based on what you know about the system, or. I, I think that's, that's one of the things that we've been wrestling with recently um, in the sense that th because this model has this, this degree of flexibility, it means you have to specify what's going into it, whether it's the overstory, the midstory, or, or, the, or the surface fuels. But when we, you know, people say, well, why can't you just make it simple? And you could come up with some default fuel beds easy enough. And for all intents and purposes, that's what a lot of the simpler models do. Um, that's not a problem to come up with this default, but it also brings up the point that in those simpler models, people need to realize that they're putting it in a default. They're, they're not dialing in. This is an Eglin uh, understory or midstory component. This is, you know, Southeast yeah, or whatever. Drop down menu. It's kind of, <laughs> kind of like using Anderson fuel models or uh, FCCS fuel beds. That could be one. Yeah, you could have those. You could build those defaults in, 
as, as drop down style options, uh, it just hasn't been the focus to, to go there yet. Yeah. It will be. Yeah. And again, at this point, we're not trying to say, or we're not trying to uh, replicate a prescribed fire. We're looking at basic or phenomenology. What happens when you light five lines of strip head fire in, in a fairly homogeneous field? A couple of things, too, that, that come to mind. One would be, you know, understanding the risk level of what it's going to take to do prescribed burning on this day under this set of circumstances with this type of holding line. And here's the fuel in the area that we don't intend to burn. What is the, how much chances are we taking? How confident are we that we can keep the fire contained in this particular area? That's the kind of stuff I deal with with variances all the time, where the districts are calling me up to get a variance for a prescribed fire, you know, because the winds are too high, or the humidity's too low, and we want to burn this, and this is why we want to burn it. And we have to go through the risk evaluation and saying, how confident are we that we're going to be able to keep this thing where we want to keep it? So the risk of being able to contain the fire, and then also risk from smoke, you know, how confident are we smoke's going to go where it's going to go. Those are the things that we deal with. But one big difference that I've seen, it's, it seems like to me, is that not every place burns with an objective to do something other than just <coughs> as its fuel. I mean, a lot of times what we were doing, especially early on, was a targeted objective to reduce either sand pine or hard. There was an intensity that we were looking for to achieve a desired effect. And a lot of times in these rolling terrain forests like I've got down now, it seems like the only objective is just to get fire in the and black. Yeah, just walk the ridges and let it black down, back down the ridge tops. Um, so it's, you know, it's different, you know, whether you're trying to achieve a very specific, you know, uh, objective, you know, for targeting some kind of mortality of mid-story or whatever else. So Carl, um, with, with respect to holding, you know, they're, they're not going to show any spotting and, and, and how fire brands are transported across a fire line is really complicated, but high grab, because it deals with all of the, you know, the fire tech component is the high grab component, it, it, it can move stuff around and, and, and you know, very realistic ways, would it be helpful to you to have, you know, this problem, the idea of probability of ignition garbage, right? I mean, it's, it's really an index of one to 10, and, and we, we don't even really have any great data to support what we have in the old appendix B, but would it be maximum distance of a, of a kind of standard fire brand? How would you want that represented? Because you can't know it ahead of time exactly which fire brand is gonna be what size and how far they're gonna go, but if a standard of a fire brand size as it's burning out and being transported and cooled and then landing, how, yeah. how would you want that represented as a manager, you know, who's signing variances with your career on? I think just something that alerts people that there's a higher chance of fire spread today. You know, I mean, they use the fire spread stuff, right. but to the degree that this model can help inform and influence things like that. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, there was, I mean, I threw the variance the other day for doing a TSI burn probably two or three weeks ago, and humidity were super low, winds were super high, and, you know, it's like, okay, you know, what's the fuel pattern outside of the TSI? Was area? it a cold day? Huh? Was it a cold day? <coughs> uh, no, I don't remember okay. being particularly cold that day, but I just remember going through the risk stuff and saying, you know, what are fuels outside, how are they, what's proximate to private property, where's our other control lines? You know, understanding the risk associated with it. Because the fire managers, uh, you know, we want to burn. We want to get fire on the ground. We all understand how important it is, especially in these southeastern ecosystems. And so the question is, is when are we taking on unacceptable risk? Mm -hmm. When are we pushing it too much? And, and to the degree that this kind of can you know, say, yeah, you just trust your gut. You know, the problem that we talked about last night is that most of us have 20, 30 years of experience. We can't trust our gut anymore because Climate's changing, weather conditions are changing. Tree mortality is not the same. I mean, we went through this epic drought in 2016, and the effects of prescribed burn a year after that were far greater than anything that we'd ever seen before in Alabama, you know, with just calm fires. And so everything's constantly changing. But the biggest thing that we deal with is risk is, you know, can we keep things where we want to keep them? And are we going to lose resources? 
So does the model does the model take into account the short range time when it does the spread across when you're doing the line? Yeah, it does, and we actually uh, in the slide that Brett's got up it shows it, but the downwind side, which is on your right, we actually ended up removing all the fuel because when we were running the original fiber we didn't have them as wide and we had slop overs <laughs> on the side and downwind. So we removed all the fuel downwind and widened the fire brakes on the side to keep it contained, particularly with the 12 mile an hour winds. Right. So yeah, it, it does take into account you know, those does, types of things. It does slop them. <laughs> well, that's good. It does. I mean, that yeah. addresses. But you'd want to do some uh, oh, ground truthing validation, different, <coughs> different conditions, different wind speeds, different fire brake sizes. There's, there's a lot of research potential there, I think. Uh, in the in the model with the ATVs, you know, it did, did a good job of what we generally observe in the field, which is that that bulge, you know, and the tendency for the anchor points to kind of pull back on fire. I wonder if you ever talk about that in terms of what causes that, and you know, also the fact that in a less heterogeneous, I mean, less homogeneous environment, you're going to have those kinds of impediments to fire that cause that that bulging effect that's going to make the fire line be very. You know, it's yeah, going to arrive at different times in different just places. Just talking to throw in like a little depression wetlands or hammock, yeah. dry hammocks or right. shades of bare soil. But a lot of that is just based on turbulence too. Mm -hmm. And fire tech does pick up on the turbulence. You'll see that more in some of the visualizations that we'll be getting into. Um, and it may answer your question when you. Okay, let's just pretend to right. see the funnel, the, the wind into the yeah, center. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, let's. let's yeah. Move on, so I think it's going to get to exactly what you're talking about. Yes. Yeah, some of the later Before videos. we run some of these uh, visualizations, uh, go over a lot of the inputs and parameters that we're used to parameterize uh, when the model runs. Uh, this is kind of our typical ground ignition uh, scenario that, uh, that you'll see throughout some of the following slides. So, this area, okay, first of all, the scales on your right and left, uh, fuel moisture uh, fraction or moisture fraction on the top right, so greener means uh, either live fuels or higher fuel moisture fraction, whereas uh, the surface fuels are, are uh, lower, obviously. And, uh, and then this is fuel density, so lighter colors, uh, higher fuel density, darker colors, like James said, we removed the surface fuel uh, downwind, and these are fire breaks, uh, obviously, top and bottom. But we left the trees in there. I don't know if that would have some effect on wind dynamics. It, it will affect the wind dynamics. So all of the runs are going to be wind coming out of the, I guess, yeah, from left to right uh, as we go along. Uh, for this one, we, we used five ATVs. At Eglin, we still do interior ignition with ATVs. You could do this with hand lighters, um, other ignition sources. Uh, for all the ground ignition runs, it's a seven and a half mile per hour rate of ignition. Uh, this run has a mid-story component. There's 150 feet between lighters. And these, pretty much except for the wind speed, are standard throughout the model runs. We just had to pick uh, a temperature. So air temp, ambient air temp of 80 degrees. Uh, you, could, you could vary all this, obviously, depending on what you're interested in, but just simplify the number of variables we, we stuck with one. Everything is going to be three and a half tons per acre of surface loading. That's just the data we had from this, uh, this forest unit. And it's fairly kind of an average for uh, two year time since burn. Uh, find dead fuel moisture, we set at 8%. Again, you could vary that. And uh, mid-story, find dead fuel moisture, so uh, dead turkey oak leaves, so forth, uh, 15%. Again, you could uh, vary all of these. So we'll uh, take a look at the simple run. Again, this is five ATVs, uh, strip, strip head fire. And we had to speed up the time stamp just because uh, I didn't want you to have to wait hours for this. We wanted to do a half day workshop instead of three days. Uh, I did, and I did skip over this. This entire unit is 75 acres, and uh, what actually ignites in five lines of ignition is about 41 acres. And I'll play this maybe a few times, but you'll see a lead lighter on your right. <coughs> and it's just a staggered 
strip uh, strip head fire, and you start to get a sense of uh, and this scale is a little tough to see, but interactive fire lines. <coughs> and interestingly, some areas of unburned here. Uh, we didn't close the flanks, and so as that uh, convective core developed in this kind of area here, uh, created actually some backing fire down in here because that fire pulled together in that core. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's still creeping around in here. Mm -hmm. If you lit the flank, which we, we did do some of those runs where we lit the flanks uh, during the interior ignition. Also start to see consumed fuel uh, in darker areas and uh, indicate greater mass loss of uh, either mid-story or, or uh, overstory canopy. So was that uh, validated by real results, the, where the consumption was and the mortality, by looking at, at past burns on that one and saying, this is what this we're is, This or, is just or this fire is just fire <coughs> run. And we skipped over kind of some of the validation or anything. Right, and, well, and the, the, the challenge is trying to find a burn on Avon that's done under the exact same weather conditions that we mm -hmm. did the model run under. So that's why we tried to get you know average temperatures so that we could get as close to that average as we could. But you know, no two fires, and of course, you know, they're you, you just can never do a direct comparison. If, if this gust comes at a slightly different time, mm -hmm. you you might pop that tree. As opposed to, to that, and, and that, that's also I'm just trying to figure out why the fire, why the model saying it's black in this spot here and black in this spot here and black in this spot. Yes, what's it taking it, into it's, account? It's the way that the, the turbulence and the indrafts occur. But that also points out, you know, one the the challenge of you know validation, you know, statistical validation because you can't mm -hmm. replicate. But it also points to the importance of exactly what we're doing here, which is getting input from people that have seen a lot of fire for a sniff test. I mean, to me, in my experience, you know, the scorch pattern that we saw there made sense. It was where those lines of fire were, were pulling together. And, you know, that phenomenology makes sense. Yeah, okay. Carl, I, I look at that, and if you go back to that pattern of, of consumption, how many times have we gone by a unit like on 241 a day when you know, that, that range road where you look in at about, a, you know, 100 yards in, there's a zone of death. Because we went aggressive, we didn't have holding concerns that day, and that's where the greatest, you almost get the strip of consumption, you know, shifted downwind of the ignition grid. And, and it, you know, in terms of just, like, gut check uh, reality, I feel like that's, that's something that, that, that jumps out of me. The other thing on this simulation that I look at is, are these flanks? How often do we just kind of, by habit, close the flanks and increase intensity because we're worried of fire escaping? Well, if you've got convection going in the middle, you know, you, you, at least the model also confirms what I know from the ground is that you know, you're, you're sort of governing or stabilizing your wind field with your core uh, burnout uh, zone in that unit. You don't have to necessarily close the flanks right away because they're going to be flattened you're going to literally be back in some cases, back in the flank, and not, you know, pose a, a threat to the line. So I'm, I, I look at that kind of, you know, gut check reality. But that zone of scores being being shifted right <coughs> is something that we we see a lot of mm -hmm. kind with of an aggressive ignition pattern like this. Pattern that kind of snakes up through there, and we do. I'll show some runs that are actually zoomed in uh, where we close the flanks, and you'll see the difference. I mean, we did not close the flanks on here. You see, not a whole lot of dark. Color, but you'll see that uh, in some future slides. Here. So, so one of the things that we haven't talked about is the way the winds are, the way the prescription of the winds here, or the way the winds are developed for these simulations, which I think is valuable to think about. So, if you think about the real wind out in a forest, you know, there's a there's a mean wind speed that we talked about that we characterize our wind with, and that's the, the five or the twelve uh, mile per hour, twenty feet above the canopy. But in reality, that's just a characteristic. I mean, in reality, it's this gusty, changing. You know, in a moment, it actually might be a reverse. It might be sideways, and so that that variability is actually a really really important piece of these simulations because without that variability you actually don't get the 
right movement of the of the momentum down through the canopy to the surface. You it it, it actually changes things with not have that variability in there. So the very so the the variability <coughs> of the wind fields here is actually developed by running the simulation of just the wind with no fire over this forest and spinning it up so that it has the right undulations and, and variability. And then that wind field is actually being fed in from the left. So it's been preconditioned to be in balance so with the got canopy. That, got that turbulence so it already tree. has that yeah. turbulence built into it. So when you say, why did that tree or that section of trees go up in those, a lot of it has to do with the timing of when did you get a gust that intersected with that fire line at the appropriate position to, to, to get up under that tree, or when did a gust come in and cool this branch, this, this uh, row of trees? So you could play a lot of games with uh, pockets of heavier fuel, maybe that didn't burn under the last prescribed burn, or a canopy <coughs> gap where you had a bunch of snags, what would that that cause, but that'd be some interesting ways, some interesting games to play. We, we, we did an experiment not very long ago with this that kind of caught me off guard, but after I talked to Kevin and some other people, it made more sense. We took a simulation like this, that had, like this one where we blackened trees, and we just took those fuels out, those canopy fuels out, left the surface fuels the same way they had been in the previous simulation. At, at the start, and we ran it, and we popped more trees. And I went, wait a minute, I just removed fuel, and I'm getting, at the, and I, I'm getting additional fire behavior. Well, A, we've done something with physical, because when you move the, remove the canopy fuels, you're also, you're also changing the surface fuels. But what I didn't consider was the fact that you punch holes in the canopy, so now you're getting additional airflow in, which in that particular case actually intensified the fire behavior and 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 made it work. So if you're not so again, you're, you can play games and sometimes the results are counterintuitive, but they're worth learning from Yeah, so early, early on when we had high mid stories when we were clearing around Ray Huck and Woodpecker Trees to reduce the mid-story for Ray Huck and Woodpecker Management, uh, we would see sometimes more, more scorching of the, of the trees that we were trying to protect when, we, when we'd burn it because we had reduced the, it was kind of counterintuitive. Yeah, yeah. That, that's exactly because all of a sudden you've got that gap in that mid-story canopy where the, you can get those mm -hmm. in drafts and up drafts. This is actually the aerial ignition scenario that we yeah, so obviously do a lot of aerial ignition on Eglin. This is a very simplified, just gridded out aerial ignition. And I know that aerial ignition can be a lot more finesse than this, uh, but we just have to go with a, with a gridded pattern, kind of normalized. Uh, larger unit, we'd love to go even larger than we did. It's a small unit for an aerial ignition. 237 acres is this area, but a lot of it's computational uh, demand is just too high. So you can, you can go bigger, but you can't run lots and lots and lots of simulations if you go big. <laughs> so, yeah, well, can you, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I probably missed this earlier, but can you remind me again how the fuel is conceptualized in FireTech? Is it is it some kind of fuel characteristic per voxel? So the way it's the way the fuel beds are developed is you have uh, for most of these simulations at least is you have a tree list. So Brett talked about the the trees that they had actually measured at Akron. So you have a tree list that has Height to life crown, crown height, crown diameter, maybe there's another parameter in there. Anyway, uh, describing a crown. And so then the then a preprocessor goes and plants that those trees on the landscape and and, and puts the the right percentage. So you dial in what your what your uh, trees per hectare are, for instance. And it literally virtually plants those trees on the landscape and then it goes through with your and like cookie cuts, you know, here's a tree and my cell is here. Let's figure out how much of that tree goes in that cell. Mm -hmm. And and so it signs. And if you have two trees that overlap, they both contribute to the 
the amount of material in that cell. So you're you're building a forest in virtual space. And, and how big are those cells at the end? Of <coughs> so in this case, they're two meters by two meters by like a meter and a half high. And then for the understory, how is that done? Yeah. Uh, it's done in a, in a similar, it can be done in a similar way. A lot of times what we'll do is prescribe, uh, prescribe an, an average um, an amount of grass in an, op in an open space and then a maximum amount of litter under trees, for instance, and it'll, it'll look at, it, it can look above it and see, here's, here's my canopy, so I don't have as much grass, I have more litter, and yeah, I'd, it, I'd kind of like to, to move on, we've got a number of more slides, right. hopefully we can get into, you know, questions, question more questions, specifically. Either, we can either circle back or get on the yeah, side. Hopefully we'll have time to, to circle back, but I want to be sure to get through the, some of the visualizations, because so we'll run this aerial ignition again. It's a relatively small unit for aerial ignition. 100 feet between uh, aerial ignition spheres. We've got the same spacing between what we're calling drifts or lines. Uh, ends up being about three ignitions per acre. Uh, this is on a 12 mile an hour, 20 foot wind speed, and then all the rest of the parameters are, are uh, the same. We had to uh, build in some delays in, uh, obviously when you do an aerial ignition, ball drops, pops open, it takes it a few minutes to really get established, kind of get that critical mass where it starts uh, creating a small point source head fire. So we built some of those delays in um, along the way. When you start seeing a point up here, the minimum uh, visualization is about a four meter diameter is when it starts showing up uh, just because of the scale. Correct me if I misspeak here, Rob. Uh, I mean, we'll start seeing uh, it, the helicopters just flying a grid, basically, and you're starting to see some spheres open here. It takes a lot longer than the strip head, obviously, bigger area and uh, just slower development. Yeah, this uh, 15 line ignition that we're looking at is the, the largest uh, that we did for this project. It's about 131 acres. You can start seeing just phenomenology interactions between point sources. We'll get some better zoom in here in a little bit on some of that. <clears throat> and I don't know if it's worth mentioning, but uh, our April sand hills can be pretty sparse in the ground cover. And so I don't know if that's part of it or it's more of a wind field rod. Did we get some areas of uh, that? didn't uh, tape as well in the beginning. Some gaps that are now pulling together. Uh, I've seen that on aerial I, I can tell you, I've been on aerial ignitions seeing uneven burn patterns like that is pretty common. I mean, because the ball got caught up in Turkey. I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it fell on some bare sand or something. Caked up the <laughs> potassium per nanometer or something. But, I mean, to me, you know, from my experience, as far as just a general sniff test, you know, it, it passed. I mean, the actual patterns of burning look very similar to what I've seen burning in the Avon Sand Hills when I've been in the helicopter. And you can see, like uh, right up here, it's starting to, maybe not the best, but is this starting to converge? I saw an uptick in fire behavior there. So just again, we're trying to get a visual understanding of phenomenology. Now this might benefit the practitioner. Keep moving. Uh, this, we, we looked at various ignition patterns. Uh, this is going to be, so we base, generally had a strip head fire, point source, and then two. We had a six meter just, dash and a 14 meter. Yeah, six meter dash. We tried to kind of find a bridge between point source and strip head fire. And at Eglin, we've been playing with this a little bit actually in the field, different uh, distances a dash pattern we call it, and then distances between dashes. So we use seven meter, 14 meter. Uh, this just happens to be a side by side between a 14 meter dash and a strip head fire. And I think, uh, is this five lines of yeah, yeah, five lines of ignition. <coughs> Same acreage uh, as the original ground ignition, which was a 75 acre unit. <coughs> Uh, you'll notice, you know, kind of as you'd expect, the strip head fire is burning with greater intensity in general. It's burning 
burning out more quickly. Which you're starting to get, it's kind of like a modified point source here. see with the strip, strip head uh, areas of uh, dark modeling indicating canopy or mid-story consumption, where you're seeing less of that, still some areas, but less of that generally or relatively in the dash ignition. So you can start looking at the same fuel bed, same, I don't know about the same wind field, but same uh, parameters that went into the wind field. Would you say it's the same wind field, Rod, or it's slightly different? It's Right. Um, these are the, it's the same upstream wind field. It's okay. the same. If, it, well, it's the same when it comes in from the left side. Okay. Throughout the simulation, but then the, as soon as it comes in, it's modified by the, by the fire itself. So. Mm -hmm. I tried to hold everything constant except for ignition pattern. Again, this stopped at 500 seconds. This one's still, still having some burnout, which you'd expect less fire on the ground. Then you can start, uh, and that's just a sample, a few runs, we'll go through some more, but you can start to analyze, at least coarsely, uh, some of these relative differences between runs that we did. And so, uh, we've got two wind speeds, either 12 mile an hour, five mile an hour. These are aerial up here in various lines. And then percent canopy and mid-story consumption combined. We actually have uh, separated out canopy consumption and other analysis. Uh, in general, higher winds, uh, more consumption. Uh, statistically, still looking at some of this, but uh, just generally slightly higher canopy and mid-story consumption with higher winds, uh, both for aerial and ground ignitions. Uh, aerial <coughs> ignitions, in this case, on a lighter rough, uh, produced overall lower consumption when compared to strip head fire, which you may or may not expect. Um, and then number of lines. So in general, you add more lines of ignition simultaneously igniting, you get higher consumption or ma mass loss in the uh, mid-story and uh, over-story canopy. So you can start getting at some real coarse relative differences there in, in potentially resource damage. Brent, did you also look at um, Spacing within the line for area, meaning more balls versus wider lines. Did we actually do that? I don't think we got that. No, we, we have talked we about that as one of the things that we would like to do is because the three spheres per acre is a little on the low side for most typically folks with average. Where we're thinking about either shortening the distance between the drifts or shortening the distance between the spheres themselves for a greater density. But we have not done that. Well, and we're teaching people in aerial ignition class that if you're starting to get hot, put up fewer balls in your line, it would be nice to validate that that's really a good That was one of our first questions. Are you still get debates among fire managers that do aerial ignition. Some say, hey, if you want to cool it down, add more balls, because then there's less, less space between balls to burn up. And then there's those that say space it out more, and is it between, is it more important between the lines of ignition or between the balls? And or is it a rate of, of laying down lines? If you start yeah. in a helicopter, I and mean, it seems like the, the slower, slower burns were, were producing a lot less. Yeah, yeah you're not getting mass, you mean don't get mass ignition. Right. Yeah. I, I think, and this is just me, wider, either wider balls or narrower lines will be cooler than the Congress. That's my thought, just uh, or my experience too, but I still run into managers and say, oh no, you need to pepper balls in there so there's less less time or uh, potential for those point sources to build up into a full head. Uh, I think the less time you have as a line heading fire in aerial aviation, the cooler it will be. And that's either because your balls are, the balls are spread out uh -huh. so they don't become a line heading fire, or the lines are together because you're close, the rows are close together before they can really get established. Yeah, so there's That's Jim and other old grant right there. <laughs>
But we, you know, we may be able to to run one of those. That that is to be one of the gaps if we're able to do that using the same fuels and everything. But just because I'm surprised, I'm kind of surprised. I'm assuming when you change the number of lines, you're changing the distance between rows, right? No, no, no. We're just 150 line. feet. We're just 150 feet. Oh, okay. So the distance is okay. I misinterpreted. Yeah. I thought you're covering the same acreage with more lines. No. And then no. I was surprised that. Yeah, the, the, the same. That's that's a good point. The the five lines for the helicopter is the same as the five lines with the ground ignition. Yeah, <coughs> ten lines with helicopters twice as many acres, etc. Well, that's a great idea for something we may be able yeah, to I, do. I, I made a note. Just on the fly, or I guess not on the fly. So, what the thing about the aerial ignition is too? I think you're affecting weather faster. Yeah. yeah we've got I mean, some you're changing things so fast uh, because there's so much fire out there at one time compared to the, yeah, the strip head fire with the four wheelers. You could actually kind of monitor what was going on at the time and adjust, widen, you know, reduce, speed up, slow down, whatever. So you could kind of see what was going on. You could fire the acres on fire before it really starts cranking, and then it's too late. Right. And then with the, with the air ignition, it was, there's so much going on. You have the ability to get on the fine tune of quite yeah. as much. So you kind of get ahead of it. You don't have to the feedback. Mm -hmm. the, way the feedback loop is five minutes too late. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. the way to look at it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know you did something wrong and you adjust for the next. Whoops. Yeah. <laughs> that was a big It's like getting a speeding ticket and then you say that I should slow down. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I think that's what most fire practitioners that are either getting into aerial ignition, some that have been doing it for a long time, that's a lot of uncertainties there, a lot of unknowns, and we're hoping some of this may at least speak to the phenomenology. Uh, we did some sensitivity analysis, or this was brought on by uh, Rod and uh, some of his coworkers at Los Alamos, just looking at bulk density increase in the mid-story, I believe, mainly the mid-story, but maybe the canopy too. When you when you parameterize those pixels, voxels, you have to assign it a bulk density, a surface area, a volume ratio, a lot of different uh, parameters. And so we just looked at what if you increase bulk density, I believe in the mid-story. Yeah, this is, this is one of the parameters. So I mentioned the, the parameters that go into building those virtual trees. One of the parameters that's not collected all that often is I mean, it's one thing to get height to life crown and crown height to diameter, but one of the things that's not collected all that often is how much how much biomass is, is in your typical tree on this landscape, which varies from site to site. I mean, it's, it's a productivity number, and so when we build when we build these virtual forests, we've got to. I mean, you can almost think of yeah, productivity of the tree. You can all you have to kind of assign come up with something. And so Kevin and James and Brett came up with a range that we eventually chose a number from, but we did sample amongst that range of call it productivities per tree to, to come up. And we did do some assessment to say, okay, we've just chosen a value, how much biomass per, per cubic meter in a healthy uh, turkey oak, for instance, but it's valuable to know how sensitive things are to that number. And I think a, a key point in this slide is you know, with the increase in bulk density, you see a much more defined pattern of consumption where those lines of fire pull together. So bottom line is that fire tech did model increased fire intensity with the, the increased density, so it was just another good sniff test that we did. <coughs> is the is the fuel data set completely separate from the just physical structure of the forest data set that influences how the wind flows? So no, they're, they're the same. Okay, so as things get consumed, then they would decrease the obstruction to the flow. Yeah, yeah. As as fuels consumed, the influence on the wind goes down. Which. Is, is actually one of the really interesting things that we were looking at for the difference between prescribed fire behavior 
and most wildfires is this in a wildfire you're burning along and you're decreasing the fuels behind the fire which is allowing more wind to come in and push it even faster because it's decreasing the drag and the wind is pushing it where because you're in, in a lot of trap fire scenarios you're, you're effectively lighting up wind the fuel that's blocking the ambient wind is staying intact until after the fire goes by. And then downwind, you're removing that. But it is it's another change in paradigm, wildfire versus prescribed fire, which is captured. You guys may have all thought about it, but I didn't think about it until I was watching the videos going, oh, that's kind of interesting. So, Well, as long as we can learn from books is Several of my staff learned that two years ago because they were burning in a really closed camp. And they burned the block to the north. And everything went great, except they were frustrated that there was almost no wind. But they were finished by 1 o'clock, so they decided to burn the next block. Downwind of that. And were amazed at how much more wind there was <laughs> in the afternoon than there had been in the morning. <laughs> I mean, no, that's these, are, these are interesting lessons mm -hmm. they, don't, they, they don't teach in, in you know, mm -hmm. any of the burn boss classes. And, and that, that phenomenon right there is, is something that we, uh, you know, I've got to ask for. It's, it's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, the, the next set of slides, and we're getting close to done with us talking at, uh, with you, uh, is more visualizations and getting your feedback on, uh, I mean, you'll see some of the phenomenology in, in, in different ways. But what's most effective for a practitioner to look at? What's most interesting? And we'll kind of run through this. Um, so the top is it's the same exact scenarios we've been running, just a different uh, perspective. Uh, this is the view from upwind. So uh, it gives you a little uh, key up there. ATVs or lighters moving uh, right to left. Wind coming from us into the distance. Background there. And it's five line ignition. Yeah, both ATV on top. Area. I may have yeah, to stop it and area. explain a few other things <coughs> as it gets to the Notice the ATVs really start cranking early, and uh, what you're seeing there, what James and I thought was smoke in the beginning, <laughs> is actually a uh, heat profile or temperature profile. Ah, shoot, I meant to pause it. Should be able to just click it and pause, right? Yeah, you should be able to. Yeah. But uh, that. There. Mm -hmm. So basically, a heat profile, everything greater than 300 Kelvin? Well, or it's, 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 so think of it as a 3D contour, okay. right? A 3D contour of the, of what's 300, of the gas temperature at 350. So things inside that envelope may be a lot higher, but it's, a, it's, just like a, a contour. Well, it gives it's you ideas of 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, it can give you ideas of uh, heat core or convective cores, mm -hmm. uh, greater thermal lift. Yeah. Obviously, you can see that you know, greater convective core and thermal lift moved along with the ATVs and is more dispersed on the helicopter, which is, of course, flying back and forth. Same amount of acreage burning, but slower burnout. So from an operational perspective, so far what you've convinced me of is if I was responsible for England Air Force Base and I was worried about my RCWs, I'd be supporting you in getting a bigger aircraft budget. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and uh, obviously we increased the, if we increased the fuel loading uh, quite a bit and grew the size of the unit, so we were doing more of a mass ignition. I mean, this is just five lines, but I think you'd see more of that that mass ignition effect. <laughs> and a lot of what a lot of what comes out of that, because it is the same size, which is different than the, what Carl was talking about earlier, but because it's the same size, you have all these holes in your in your pattern for the cool air to get in and then train it in the middle and dilute that heat, which means you don't get that, that up updraft core. Whereas if you get bigger and bigger size by the time you get to the interior you you've already that that fresh air that was coming in from the exterior has already gotten heated up and it's true it's true though that you could dash the atv lines and make it more like the 
Yeah, yeah, and we actually did model some of that as well. And we don't, you know, have the time to be able to show all the different runs that we did, but the the dash ignitions were lower intensity, you know, when we compared to consumption numbers. But this is the same exact model run. We removed the trees just to see if we could get better visual that way. And it's also, this is a, a crosswind view. So again, down here, wind coming left to right, ATVs moving this way, just a different view, and we removed the trees. So same exact model run, just a different way to visualize. <coughs> So Rod, since I don't think in Kelvin very often, how how what's the threshold on that uh, that envelope? One seventy Fahrenheit. One seventy. Wow. It could be real useful for uh, uh, inputs to smoke models too, uh, given those kind of plume cores. Uh, Do you have an approximate scale on this? Like we actually on the next one, there's a scale. It's, it's actually harder than you'd think to put a scale on this because at the front of the picture, mm -hmm. the scale is one size and at the back of the picture, <laughs> the scale is different yeah. because it's got perspective on it. I just didn't know if this was like, you know, a thousand acre burn or a laboratory burn or... Right. No, the scale... <laughs> oh, these, these are the same burns. These are 41 acres. Okay. They're 41 acres. It's actually, yeah. Small scale, less computing requirements. <laughs> so from a management... Uh, scenario what would be useful you know it's one thing if you're in the maintenance mode and it's another one if you're not in the maintenance mode if, if you've got you know some pretty borderline unacceptable conditions you know with mid-story whatever and um, the fire intensity is going to be different than if you're just in a simple you know 18 to 24 month return um, and so understanding the consequences of one or the other. It's different for both of those scenarios. And then also understanding the smoke. I mean, the assumption is that aerial ignition builds a column and gets that column up and out faster than ground ignition. So being able to see what happens with the smoke column in both of these is uh, be pretty useful from a master perspective just to say, you know, we're, we're pushing the envelope. You know, we can only burn this particular area with this wind direction. And that wind direction will take the smoke towards Birmingham. And, and you know, we're rolling the dice. Is it going to affect Birmingham or is it not going to affect Birmingham? A significant portion of our forest needs to be burned with that wind direction. So, understanding the smoke plume and what's going to happen and the level of risk that we're taking is pretty important. So, one of the things that we've noticed in the simulations going to the, what you said was, we took the same plot and, if, and, and oriented it different with regard to the wind or burned it under a different wind. The aspect ratio of its width to depth, where depth is parallel to the wind, changes the plume structure significantly because, because um, if it's oriented this way, it looks a lot like the five line, the five line scenarios. But if it's oriented the other way, um, especially with, a, with an aerial ignition, for instance, you get, it, it's harder for that ambient wind to get through and penetrate, dilute it, so you get more of a pump. So yeah, there's- That's, that's real, like that's that. real useful information. The shape of the unit. To basically. understand, because we have those kind of choices we can make when we're putting in and we're designing the units. I like to call them burn blocks, uh -huh. which is the maximum we would consider doing, and then units, which was, if we can't burn a maximum, then what are we going to go ahead and carve it up into? And we have choices we can make with <coughs> those lines and configurations. Right. So would you rather strip it this way, or especially when you can, if there's consequences from a smoke management perspective, this way or that way, that's really useful information for a manager to have. It's, I never thought about that. But that is an interesting point. That configuration design. That's, that's, that's one cool. thing we have control over is the design of the blocks. So. Kevin, would you have some real quick? I do need to keep no, it let's roll. Same exact run again. This is uh, same view actually, but we Rod and this visual visualization tool they added a vertical wind speed, so 
they colored the plume, so red is red is up, up and blue is down. Blue is <coughs> down draft. So it's actually the exact same plume that we looked at in the previous one. It's just color coded to show <laughs> up draft versus down draft. So we do have the, <coughs> the scale. Mm -hmm. that you see that that yeah. Right, it's just the contour of the of the hot a contour of most people think, or a lot of folks, and I've been educated for a long time, everything's going up, all the heat's going up. There's a lot of mm -hmm. train yeah, a lot of in turned down <coughs> turbulence. Yeah, so all the blue there is is air motion that's actually down. Here. So just another way to visualize. But closed canopy forest, you may have less of that going on. Mm -hmm. Low basal area, open canopy for us, less cool air entrainment and down wraps. Uh, another way to look at it, this is uh, actually with five mile per hour winds and some new visualization software. Is this the newer? Yeah. So, a little different colors. We have surface fuels uh, down in here, a little bit more zoomed in. This is just the, I guess if you want to call it a southeast corner of the plot unit. A darker mid-story bare ground is, is uh, fire breaks and downwind. Uh, there are there's going to be some colors uh, again red meaning updraft, blue meaning downdraft, and then the wind field corresponding wind field is simultaneously running to the right. I may have to run this a few times to get a flavor for it. So if you look to the left, you can see, and this is down. This is kind of mid canopy height. For these winds, and if you kind of watch on the left, that's where the, the there's gusts here and there of different winds, wind bursts that are coming. Yeah, there's some interesting phenomenon. So this is a uh, just one timestamp that we looked at, and maybe James you can take. Through. Well, I'm just making the point. When I was going through this, I just found it really fascinating and and I think instructive for somebody who's just learning about burning. There are a number of things going on here. One, you can easily see the, the end drafts that are coming in and this convective pool is happening. But look what's happening on what would be your downwind line. It's being drawn towards the middle. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much quit spreading downwind. Everything is just being drawn in. So to me, it's just a, a powerful visual, especially when you've got those side by side. You can actually see, you know, even up here, your winds are being pulled back in towards that convective core, which you know, most of us have experienced on prescribed burns, so that's just the, the main point. Uh, and also on this one, it's important to realize that you know, red isn't heat. You know, red just means it's going up, and that would be important when we get into one of the other ones where we're showing. The other thing that, that, that this visualization points out is that when you think about there's all this air that's rising, that also means there's all this air that's dropping. Right. Because it's got to fill the voids, <clears throat> and that dropping air oftentimes means cooling. Like James said, once that convective core cooled down, it started spreading with ambient wind and down the line again, pick back up. On this one. Is uh, the bulk intensity of this comparable to a uh, real fire? In other words, how many minutes it took to burn that that area? Is that, I'm just asking it, is that, is that roughly what, yeah, how many it, minutes it would take? It's, it's sped up. I mean, we're speeding it up. Well, no, I don't mean, the, I don't mean the projection time. I, I mean, when if you ran ATVs at seven and a half miles per hour through there, it would probably be five minutes. So it, that short of a, just five lines, five minutes, that would all burn out. And, uh, so 201 speed. seconds is, is reasonable. Yeah. So three, uh, keep in mind that that clock Actually, that's starting from after. On the ATVs, it's probably straight up, but on the other ones, it's 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 already jumping past the delay time of this right. emission stage. Right. Yeah. So for the ATVs, it's it's real time, and, and the general rates of spread you know, seem to be represented. Yeah, that hasn't been a a real focus. The next series of slides, we're actually going to look at what happens when you close the flank, or at least how it's simulated. So, 
Again, five, five ATVs, five lighters, staggered. Uh, this is open flanks, closed flank, and uh, this happens to be at a 90 second time stamp. So you can already see you're getting a little bit of a little fire pulling off that line into the interior. At 120 seconds, uh, start seeing, it's not really visually uh, obvious here, but seeing a little bit more of a convective core developing there, some heat. And then you can look at wind fields, comparing open flank, closed flank. You can see that with open flank, you're getting more of that cool, or I don't know, it's not cool, it's downdraft, or at least wind being able to uh, move interior, where a lot of this, the wind is hitting that flank and uh, rising. Is that reasonable, Rob? Is most of that wind coming from above the canopy, it's skirting the top of the canopy, that blue indraft on the bottom? It, it, I'm not sure where we're, yeah, yeah. Our slice we're at here. But. Yeah, this is sort of mid canopy height, so the blue is largely being traded down from above. Oh, so that's, that's below the top of the trees, then, that, mm -hmm. that slice. Yeah. So, so we've been going at it pretty hard. We're going to take about a five minute break, or go.
the uh, comparison that we did with the burn on during RX Cadre at Eglin Air Force Base, we actually modeled using the same uh, parameters that were measured on the fire, and there's a, a neat comparison that's included there. So if, if you get a chance sometime to take, take a look at the, the poster as well, it's got some things that are, are not on the flyer and that are not covered in the presentation. So just another way, uh, again, same same simulation, but uh, looking at just wind field at the two meter, uh, I guess altitude or height. Um, I don't know, Rod. I stared at this slide and I, I haven't made head really headway on differences between the two. But actually, just another way to look at wind field. I actually <laughs> think there's something messed up on the slide. Okay, <laughs> let's skip on. If I look at those, I think those are actually. I think we should skip off. Okay. There's uh, again same simulation, different view. Uh, this is from looking uh, into the fire from downwind. And before we get started, so kind of ambient wind field pre-fire up here. Uh, red is coming towards you, and blue is going. Blue arrows going into the distance or uh, into the fire. And just uh, another. Another way of visualizing, I'm really focusing on wind fields here, or wind dynamics. Now this one is really interesting. You can see some uh, some roll vortices that get started near these uh, convective cores as the ATVs are, are moving across. <coughs> yeah, so that same convective core that we keep seeing kind of in the bottom right corner so uh, what's going on here? So all this, all these arrows and the strength of the arrows, higher wind speeds coming towards us, um, out of the fire, and then some, some end draft there. Yeah, anything that's blue means it's being pulled counter to the ambient wind back into the fire. And the white vectors essentially mean they're going vertical. So you can definitely see those end drafts close to the, the plane in front on the down the inside. Mm -hmm. You can see those vortices rolling when you get the big updrafts. So one of the one of the interesting things I think for, for scrap fire practitioners is how the edges of units affect fire behavior. I mean it's obviously where you're most vulnerable, um, you know, when you light and you know when fire is when those those cores develop and in proximity to the unit, how winds move around, I think is really neat. Neat element of this one that, that I haven't seen before until until you guys produced you know, just the wind vector. And like Steve said, you could uh, play a lot of games with a clear cut next to your unit, or closed canopy forest on one side and clear cut on the other, or you know, just the way those kind of ambient or outside of your unit. Forest structure plays into wind dynamics. <clears throat> and then looking at closed versus open flank, so blues, it's all five mile an hour, five line ignition. This is closed flank. Uh, this, is, this is open flank, I guess it would be in that aerial. And uh, all the understory pretty much consumes, or 80, 90%. And, Closed versus open with the mid-story uh, consumption is about the same. Canopy, though, you start to see some differences, and then when you combine the two. So we're starting to get a little bit higher consumption, hard to tell how significant with closing that flank. And it would probably be exaggerated or more pronounced uh, the larger your ignition is, how fast you close that flank, wind speed uh, along that flank, so forth. You can start teasing out, potentially, some differences in canopy loss or canopy consumption from various ignition strategy tactics. I believe that's maybe it on some of the example runs. And we can revisit these on some of the discussion, uh, or we can, yeah, we can just come back to some of these slides as people have thoughts. I do want to make some acknowledgments, obviously, uh, DOD 
uh, ESTCP, Environmental Security Technology Certification Program, uh, funded this project, so I've got to give them appropriate props there. Los Alamos couldn't have done it without their supercomputing resources and just uh, theoretical and computational knowledge and experience, expertise. Uh, Air Force One on Fire Branch, which uh, funds James and I's position, and as well as the Forest Service, uh, James. Southern Fire Exchange has been a huge partner in this and the outreach, uh, making this meeting and other webinars uh, meetings possible. Tall Timbers Research Station for uh, Kevin's time and expertise and facilities. And the Arts Cadre, large uh, prescribed fire research experiment we did at Eglin. They shared a lot of data to help uh, do some early comparison and, and sort of validation on, on fire tech and how well it modeled some of these smaller RX Cadre fires. And with that, I think we'll move into more of a facilitated discussion unless uh, anybody has thoughts. James, do you need any visuals? You want to just keep <coughs> this up here for uh, as people have thoughts or questions? Um, yeah, you can just leave the questions slide up there for now. <coughs> but if you uh, if you look in your packet and pull out, you'll find the uh, two pages uh, with focus questions. Uh, uh, we really like for everybody to individually for, for starters to uh, go through and write down first impressions of your, your thoughts on uh, you know, all the questions that are here. I'll give you about you know, five or ten minutes just to uh, to fill that out and we'll go around and, and generate some discussion. We'll do the, the first page, generate some discussion, go as long as you need to on that, and then we'll uh, take some time and do the second page. And uh, it looks like you know we're doing okay on time. We'll probably take a break after the doing the first page. But Rob does have some additional uh, uh, fire tech runs that show some of the or address some of the questions that were brought up regarding uh, fire brands and topography and some of those kinds of things. So you know. At that point, we'll probably you know, plug his laptop into the projector and let you see some of those other things, just so you understand kind of more broadly what some of the potential options are with the biotech program. Even if you just put bullets in here, things that struck you be helpful to us. So yeah, just take about uh, you know, the five or ten minutes, and then we'll come back and, and go through y'all's impressions on the on this and you folks that are online I, I forwarded a package to you that, that has this and uh, we hope that we can get the feedback from you guys as well um, you can either scan it and send it to David I guess is that would be the best way to to do it you've got David Goblin's uh, email address also a chat box, right? Yeah, they can also leave feedback directly. Yeah, and so uh, if, if you folks, uh, David's monitoring the chat box. If you've got the questions or input that you want to put into the workshop, uh, that'd be great. And uh, appreciate you guys, gals, joining us today.
on the uh, last question on what visualization, you just put the slide number, if you like. Would that be the, the easiest way to, to reference it?
but it doesn't all work real fast. Looks like most people are, are finishing up, so I'd like to go ahead and <coughs> go around the room. Maybe uh, start to agree with you on kind of uh, let's just go with the, the first question on initial response. You know, what parts excited, and so if there are parts that cause you concern, yeah, uh, you know, I guess I saw this like. Maybe three years ago or two years ago, you guys did a, did a presentation, and yeah, I mean, this it's just a great potential. I think the tool is, is really there. Um, so yeah, that's my initial response. I mean, it's really great potential. The exciting uh, parts, you know, just the whole way of creating scenarios, you know, to where you can you can manipulate it no matter how you want to do it to get those different <coughs> visual effects, you know, the dots and the aerial versus AQB. Um, and, you know, for me, of course, Park Service, we can't use ATVs, that type of deal, so we do a lot of hand emissions, so knowing that, you know, we can s slow that down and, and kind of be able to utilize it that way. Um, parts that concern me, I, I guess it sounds like it's, it's such a, a big commitment of computer resources, it's it's really not user friendly at this point. Yeah, it, yes. yeah it, it's yeah. not something that you know, any of us going to be able to run right away right. on our you know, computers right. at work. You know, there's not a, a friendly user interface available. So it does have right. those right. limitations right. At, this, right. at this point. Right. But right. wait a few years. Yeah, oh yeah. A few no. years I think it will be there. Um, were there any were there any other questions that you had about uh, Pyrotex capability? Well, <laughs> my biggest one is you know I do a lot of mountain burning, so being able to utilize it in a different environment, you know, terrain driven slope aspect, north versus south aspect, you know that whole that whole. Right. I think that's exactly where things are 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 pointed currently. For, for, we haven't. Played there, but there's nothing in the model that says you can't. That, there's no physics that's missing to do topography, and I think the north aspect versus south aspect, the key thing that's fuels necessary fuel is just translating that to what does it mean in terms of the fuel. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, were there any visualizations that you thought were? Your most promising, your most useful is a well, I, You know, <coughs> what we saw, the just that heat vapor, you know, was the one that pretty much like smoke. Looks like smoke. I think that's really, really neat to be able to see how that moves and change. And then, of course, those wind vectors and how those, how those react based on the strips. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. How about you, John? <coughs> Start uh, yeah, a lot, of the, a lot of the same things. I'm excited about the model. Um, you know, just the ability to have the multiple emissions and how they interact and what that means for, you know, fire behavior. Um, and I had similar concern, you know, the ability for a user to plug in custom, you know, I mean, even if it's like a website you can go to and plug in some parameters and wait a week and get a result, you know, just to have something that would maybe apply more to your, your program egg one or something. Um, questions about capabilities. You know, not everybody's going to be able to burn in 10 minutes. So, does it, you know, if you're doing a 100 acre block by hand, does it account for the changes in like fuel moisture and stuff throughout the, the day? Can it do that? You know, if you're going to have different fuel moisture at 2 p.m. than you are at 10 a.m., you know, for the same burn block. We have never done that, but there's no reason. Why that couldn't be built into the? I mean, 
it, there's no, it's, couldn't do it today, but given a couple of days of, of, or a day of coding, there's no reason why you couldn't say, let's have the, um, let's have the fuel moisture follow this curve through the day, right. for instance. And, and Kevin's been working on some empirical stuff that might help guide what does that curve look like. Based so there's no reason you could not that. Based on the sun's the patch of fuel at the time. Well, so that, I mean, you know, humidity drop. Right. You know, you're, you know, you're more like a yeah. four-hour window as opposed to a ten-minute window. It, right. For, for most burns. You know, That's so. right. Um, and then, like, the ability to add, you know, right now it's pretty homogenous fuels, you know, putting in I heard somebody talk about that, putting in varying fuel beds to that would affect different things. You know, if you've got hardware dynamics or whatever in there. Um, and then another question about ambient, about fuel or the canopy consumption, does that take into account ambient air temperature? Like if you're burning when it's 30 degrees outside versus 80 degrees outside, that's going to affect your canopy mentality. That, that is practically there. Yes. Yeah. So you know, we just set the temperature at 80 degrees. But that's kind of when a lot of burning takes place in long leaf pine okay. forest, and we had to choose a degree. But yeah, th those in drafts and down drafts are going to be cooler if it's 30 degrees, and it's going to affect the physics. So good question. Yeah. John's point though is really good. I mean, because that's the choice managers have: is do we burn it in the winter? Do we burn it in the springtime? You know, should we mm -hmm. burn it in late fall? And understanding the potential consequences and the fire effects would help inform that instead of just being a choice of availability. <laughs> right. You know, right. uh, we you know <laughs> might be a little bit more informed decisions. So. Yeah. 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 Good. Good form. And then uh, same for me, my visualizations. And, you know, remember slide seventeen that oblique angle when you're looking down mm -hmm. the strips. You know how those come together and how that heat. You can see where the heat goes. And then from my perspective, like slide nine, which is up on the poster there, you know, just showing that for us as an agency, you know, our big, you know, big concern of course is impacting outside folks with smoke and push on your fire to get off. But if you're burning in the middle of takes hell, you know, if the fire escaping, that's one of your minimum concerns is are we killing the trees? So you know, doing the, the canopy mortality, I think, is, you know, if one of your primary management objectives is production, I mean, you know, keeping your overstory intact is important. So, right. so, you know, having confidence in that model, that part of the model, the canopy um, consumption, that I think is, is pretty important for a lot, of, a lot of folks, you know, to show how these patterns, you know, affect the canopy less than that. I hope you understand that. Yeah, good, good points. Jeff? <clears throat> so, some of the same things as Audie had said, but for me, it's just something that's been missing in the fire modeling world is <clears throat> having this type of modeling. You know, everything has just been mostly for wildfires, and this seems more specific to support and use it for either um, shrub or wildfire. So, I think it's something that we definitely need. So, I'm excited about that. Uh, the fact that you can uh, run the different scenarios and that you can see the various consumption, because I think that's important, especially, you know, before service, I don't see much monitoring going on, so I can see this being like, kind of a piece of that uh, to help monitor, you know, if they're saying that they're, they're looking for some sort of consumption, who's going back out there to look at it to see if we're actually meeting those objectives, or maybe something like this to say, hey, well, if we do it this way, this is the kind of consumption we'll get versus, so I, I see it being a piece there. See other questions. When are we going to be able to use it? But you said a couple of years. <laughs> um, I did have a couple of questions though about um, on one of the slides. I don't know if now it's appropriate time to ask. Sure. It's pretty quick. And it has to do with the consumption. But and I know you did these specific scenarios. But like for instance, higher winds produce greater consumption for all ignition scenarios. And so I know that that's not always true. Like depending on if you light something and it goes too quickly, it doesn't really con have a higher consumption. You know, sometimes you want that lower. You know, that longer residence time. So I don't know all the variables that are going into it. So I don't. I mean. So I think that also depends on. I mean, I know that that, that that varies with surface 
So if you have lighter surface fuels, for instance, and you have faster winds, your, your, your fire may spread faster on the ground, but you're getting more entrainment and more mixing of the air, and therefore less impact on the canopy when you have higher winds. So, so the, the way the wind influences the fire behavior and the effect on the canopy, I notice in the simulations, changes with the kind of surface fields you have for instance. Right. So it is again uh, this problem seems a little amorphous in many ways because there's no there's no clear cut <laughs> rule to anything. Right. It's like well under this condition you get option A. <laughs> it gets under that back condition you get option B. Right. And, and so it's it's a way to explore those things. Right. But I think having the experts say check and make sure it does this, check and make sure it does that. That's the feedback that's critical for continued model refinement and development and, and making and gaining confidence in what it's doing. And that's things that I absolutely can't provide. Well, we only used five mile an hour, 20 foot, and 12. Right, that, that's right. the point. Right. I mean, nice to you get, it gets to back to the point that Carl was making earlier. You get those higher wind speeds where you've got a lot of you know, cool air coming in and keeping that heat out of the canopy and you might end up with lower consumption but for the 12 mile an hour winds which were somewhat you know, moderate winds you know, compared to the 5 mile per hour for you know, these 5 line emissions you know, all great. those things taken into account you know, to me it passes the, the sniff test. It'd be nice to go but, the range like some threshold things well, go yeah. from 2 to <laughs> I don't know if it's I don't know if it's the wind that's as important as the fuel moisture scenario. You know, I mean, it's it's prescribed at eight and fifteen for those. But uh, you know, when the scenarios we're talking about with Carl and and, and Jen, you know, you're pushing it across light fuels, but maybe right after a rain. I mean, you, you know, you're using you're using wind to overcome something else that's a drag that's a right. quote unquote drag on combustion. And and I really there's these nonlinearities that are really hard to, to discern in this model. And yeah. uh, you know that's. I mean, that's, it well, is what it is. Like John said, and it changes throughout the day. If you're, right. the sun's shining and the wind's blowing and it's getting hotter. And well, it can or it can't. I mean, you can, I encourage people in areas if they're doing first burning in especially thick places where you don't want to send people in on the ground, pick an overcast day because the humidity is going to change less in an overcast day. Sunshine's not going to play against you. So, yes, I'm playing with fuel moisture. Yeah. But the way I'm teaching people to identify the day is picking overcast day. Right. Well, because it's more stable. And getting back to what the practitioner can learn, I, I don't think we're ever going to be able to just run this ahead of a burn and totally predict what's going to happen. But if they can start keying into, oh, fuel moisture changes throughout the day, and this is what happens. Under this fuel moisture, this happens relative to this fuel moisture or wind speed. And start getting yeah. people to start thinking more than just... Uh, I don't know, kind of what they learned in S290. And, and if we can give them some good visual cues for rules of thumb that are easy to remember, you know, those are you know some of the things that I think that we can can glean from this as well. You know, in, in general, multiple lines ignited quickly is going to produce more scorch than fewer lines ignited more slowly. You know, Giving breaks in your ignition lines is going to burn cooler than solid lines of ignition. Lacing up the flank is going to burn hotter. And showing people those visuals so that they don't have to learn it out on the fire line, you know, taking canopy out. So, and some of those lessons that we've all learned over the years are counterintuitive. I mean, the first time I'm teaching somebody that when you're doing an initial fuel reduction burn, go overcast, they look at me like I've lost my mind because they want that nice clean burn, they know what happens on nice sunny days with blue skies. Well, yeah, you can get a real clean burn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on the neighbor's property too. There they are. So, uh, Jim, any particular? You know, I just thought all the visualizations are great. I mean, we don't have anything like that really. So I, I think they're a great learning tool. We <coughs> taught, you know, use and even training classes. Um, I don't know if there's one specific one that I have to so I think one of the take home messages on the visualization is that there's a huge amount of flexibility there, but certainly I don't, and collectively we don't know what what addresses the questions, what 
We don't always know exactly what questions we should be addressing with the, with the visuals. And especially when it's, in, in my case, I can dream up, oh, this would be cool to look at. Well, that may or may not be relevant at all. So on the fly, I mean, next, next month, when you're looking at a problem, you say, I wonder about that. Or when, when, when a practitioner has that question, or I'd like to be able to explain why this happens, shoot an email and says, hey, can you, can you somehow find a way to visualize and illustrate this? And my email is included in the packets that I handed out on cards there. And a lot of redaction on that card. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I like the areas that you can see where the consumption is happening. I think that's really, that's key. It's showing the different life patterns. And Kevin? Um, of course, you've seen most of this before. <laughs> One of the things that still excites me about this particular tool and the suite of models that you have is that, that you know, these complex tools don't necessarily have to be operational in the immediate sense, but they're great planning tools and teaching tools. You know, when you're thinking about, you know, some of the state certified burner, you know, you know coursework or, or S13190, and you look at the you know, our, our drawing representation from Dale Way that we all use on flanking fire dot ignition, you know, or that grid pattern ignition and, and strip head fire. Imagine being able to teach off of a video instead. So I think that, that the visualization, you know, from the very get-go should, should replace some of the, the still drawings we have in basic wildland fire training and prescribed fire uh, certification. And, and that's not just because John's here. But <laughs> the other thing that I, that I really saw is the potential for silvicultural and, and fire planning you know as you, as you because you can manipulate a lot of times especially out west we're cutting to manipulate fire behavior and Rod's already done some of this you know putting this kind of work to, uh, putting these kinds of tools to work for the plan and if you've got to your planning horizon you know being able to create a silvicultural pattern that, that does affect fire behavior under you know certain conditions where you expect or that leads to successful prescribed fire application later is, a, is another great, exciting opportunity here. And again, those, those planning horizons are, are operational. It's just not, you know, next farm period on wildfire operation. The, the things that, that, that keep giving me cause for concern are, um, you know, the flanking and backing fire, or, or, you know, that's the, already improved, but, you know, flanking and backing fire are really, really important options, and, and they, they, they still, you know, sometimes we don't see uh, the model capturing that, that continuation of the back and fire in particular. Um, the difficulty in explaining what validation is, Carl picked up immediately on that. You know, is it valid? You know, and, and we could ask the same thing of every other fire tool, but, but that's not, that's like deflection instead of an answer. <laughs> you know, and so be, having a really good answer for validation is something that, that is still a concern. I've got some thoughts on that later. But then the, uh, the last thing is that everybody's asked for sort of some one-off scenarios. And I think among the, the, the suite of, of runs that you've got, it would be worth having a high moisture scenario. It would be worth having a cool day scenario. You know, just nothing, you know, that, that pairs with kind of a standard <coughs> five line ignition. And, and one, you know, just not a whole lot of work, but something that, that you know, is in the, the hopper and says, well, we don't have 70 runs of, the, of this high moisture versus all these winds, but you know, here's what happens if you if you jack up the fuel moisture on a 12 mile an hour wind day, and uh, and Carl can say, okay, well that. So similar to the well, we here's a sensitivity, here's a here's a fuel loading sensitivity demonstration, here's a moisture level sensitivity demonstration, and a tow load demonstration. I mean, so those three have all been brought up by various people and, and would be really worthwhile as you roll it out to managers because they're going to have the exact same questions. And, um, you know, even if you're just saying, hey, here's rolling hills, like, you know, like Carl described at the Monkey District. I mean, it, it's still long leave. It would be interesting to see. What was the third kind of fuel moisture topography? And a cool day example, that high wind cool day. Yeah, like if you're burning, it's 30 degrees. Yeah, yeah I mean, leave the same, yeah, I mean, you still have the 8% fuel moisture or whatever, just uh, what about that cool air entrainment? Does it change your scorch? And, and, and it is kind of a sensitivity uh, of that. Right. And, and there are some simulations that we have not shown where we did do the uh, reduced fuel versus maintenance stage 
with higher fuel moisture. And so, you know, we haven't shown all of the scenarios that we have done in the interest of time, but it definitely could be useful to to do the ones that you're talking about. I think the the challenge as as I run into some gotchas in recent times on other similar problems, the challenge here is when you start doing things like manipulating the air temperature, well that's easy enough to do, but are you capturing the other things that typically are correlated with a change in air temperature? For instance, um, in a, you know, do you capture the change in humidity, even though you might have fuel moisture that was the same at that instant, do you drive moisture off at a different rate because you've changed? And just making sure that they, you know, it's like I, I was talking about. You can remove you can remove trees and then say, well, how did my fire change? Well, did that have a does that typically have an effect on the surface fuels under in the absence of the trees that, that you are or you just have to remember what are all the added things that go with that change and not portray something that's inappropriate but because you didn't get all the correlated changes. Well, I think that managers are really good at aggregating them all, all the all the things together. You know, we, we, that's that's what they do, right? right? But they're not really we're not good at picking out the mechanisms as to why. Everybody's got a theory as to why, but we, we choose a day based on Gestalt, and, and that Gestalt is integrating all that stuff together. Right. But if we had the question, you know, I mean, how specifically under this scenario is that cold is that cold air entrainment going to differ from your, your warm air entrainment? You know, that's 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 sort of a mechanism to answer easy. because you're holding everything else constant. Right. And and I, I really do like that. Last thought um, is the grid and this concern is the grid pattern aerial ignition is it scale dependent such that you know you're you know are we are we getting a big enough scale in order to, to really get at the, the plume dominated I, I, I think I think the answer is no we were hoping that we would start to see that yeah. you know going with 15 line mm -hmm. ignition but you know we weren't. We even you know, laced up the flanks on one of them. And didn't get that. You know what I call the donut hole of death in the yeah. middle. Yeah, and maybe some threshold of fuel loading or fuel moisture and fuel loading. Because we're, I know at Eglin that used to be more common where you get the plume dominated and it all sucks to the middle. Mm -hmm. but it's pretty rare these days because our fuel loading's down. Yep. And only when we go to like a five plus year rough on a drier day that we start seeing in lighter winds where. Yeah, I think that you know what we've done so far. The use is not necessarily illustrating aerial ignition versus ATV, but just spot ignition, point source versus. And that may be another better way to explain. And, 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 yeah, because we just, I mean, to do a you know what would be the equivalent of a fifteen hundred acre aerial burn, just yeah, the folks that. Los Alamos National Lab with the haters called Rob and leaving up all their computation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Rob, yeah, Rob would hate me, which uh, I'd rather not have happen. But, uh, Steve, what you got? Um, so, uh, what's the initial response? It's especially cool for me because it finally captures multiple ignition. I mean, that's something we've all been hoping for. Um, what causes me concern, uh, it is pretty specific to a fuel type or ecosystem so far. Um, and if I, I would be, obviously my bias is expressed in this, but the next one I would want to see is Palmetto Belberry under slash pine. Uh, simply because of how many acres of that are occurring in the southeast, that would be the next one I would think would be important. Um, what questions? I really think you have an opportunity to tinker with sphere spacing um, versus line spacing with aerial to try and show people um, that. So I took a class in my master's called Fire Paradigms and we're supposed to question everything we've ever been taught about fire. And sometimes when you question it, it validates it. Sometimes when you question it, you find out that that was bogus from the beginning. Um, it would be, this would be a convenient way to check what we're teaching people about aerial ignition and spacing is does that really change the temperature the way we say it? Um, 
I also think you have an opportunity here to, um, flank fires are the most underutilized firing technique and I don't think we do a good enough job of teaching them. And so showing people what flank firing would do in this scenario versus dot strip heading um, would be a real cool opportunity. Uh, what visualizations, uh, I picked 13, 14, 15, and 17. Um, and one of the things I think before we can, sort of like before we could run behave on a computer, we built nomograms. I think you guys could run these under various scenarios, whether you like flanking or spacing or whatever, and come back with a pixel percentage of how much canopy consumption were you getting under those. And we could create essentially a nomogram for people until we're waiting for computers to either catch up with what you've already written or to dumb down what you've written to the point where it can work on a normal computer. But run enough of them that you can do some charts to the point where it shows people what they're choosing between. Um, are we supposed to do the second page too? Uh, no, we'll come back to okay. the second page. I figured, I, I, know, I saw Paul was already blazing ahead doing the second page. <laughs> <laughs> that's like a good thing. Over that's a good thing. That's good. How about you, Kate? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I was thinking about, about the visualization and that idea that you just mentioned about nomograms. Uh, I, think it's, I think that's, a, that's very interesting. I mean, there, there, there are generic net calculations that can be done with a model to represent whether it's spread rate or area consumption or bulk. Uh, bulk quantities uh, that can generate uh, plots that you can use, you know, versus wind speed or versus versus moisture content or uh, that sort of thing. And, and for the more complicated situations, as Rod has said many times, there there are many many parameters in this model. And one way that people do it in the climate business is they do composites. And so composite uh, model. Uh, synthesis is a, is, is a way to present a whole bunch of different scenarios sort of all at once. Like everything that flanks can do or everything that, 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 that dots can do, you can sort of average those together and get a typical result as a case study. Anyway, uh, I'm not a fire manager, so my remarks don't reflect that side of things, but uh, the validation point has come up a couple times, and I think of that as both a point of concern and a point and an opportunity because I think that uh, understanding how the model works is important, it will be more important, and, uh, but it gives the opportunity to go out and compare uh, actual burns with what the model predicted and produce different plots, for instance a consumption plot or some other uh, distribution that's important to, to, uh, to people. Uh, and, uh, by digging into those details, I think it, it, it both improves the model and improves our understanding of how, how to use it in the, in the real world. Um, I think one thing that would be interesting is, uh, is, is to represent the burning in the soil. It seemed to me in these, in these uh, model solutions that the, uh, these blocks burnt and that was it, and it's black, and that's the end of the story. But for instance, I live in a, near a lake, and if you light that area, it can burn for days, right, or weeks. And so, is there some other dimension to to the uh, to the combustion side of things that could be yeah, represented? And for is this a fairly piece? well maintained longleaf pine forest like our model, there's typically very little duff, very little organics. To yeah, duff. Well, so that's that's the word I, I was looking for. But <coughs> uh, that was just a question. Um, uh, <coughs> one, the last thing was so uh, here, especially in the summer, we often get the sea breeze phenomena, and I wondered if if there's a interest or if there's a utility, I guess is, is a better word, the utility to to uh, forcing the model with some kind of uh, strong conditions that come through, say, in the afternoon, or, uh, you know, a thunderstorm picks up. We know the model is representing the boundary layer in, in kind of a mean and a variance, and you're, you're, you create, you spun up the model to produce, to produce a boundary layer. So I think I have a slide there. 
Okay. Yeah, and, and, and <coughs> we talked about some of those kind of things. That was just outside of the scope of this sure. particular project, but yeah. But they have feedback. Could be highly useful though. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but usually we try and you know, figure out when the sea breeze is coming through. Well, and either use it. Or when there's somebody it. mentioned case studies, I mean, you know, so there could be a yeah. case study when boom, sea breeze hits. Well, Some especially for training. Them. Right. Yeah. Training for a training purpose. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, to to me, the most exciting thing about the model is just the potential to actually understand why fire is doing what it's doing, as opposed to just the old methods of empirically looking at it and trying to come up with a model that imitates what we see. You know, because then, you know, obviously the endless flexibility of answering different questions. Um, and, you know, just being able to refine very specific understandings of specific situations, of course, is, is really exciting. I, I, as an ecologist, I was kind of looking at a lot of these things kind of differently, too. You know, it's exciting to me is the potential to, if we were to link this with um, an ecological understanding of, of, of vegetation recovery in between fires, looking at how one, how the spatial pattern of fire effects would influence a subsequent fire, and thus a subsequent fire, and how maybe like the patchiness of burns or the, the structure of fire effects cumulative effect, affect each other over time. Because you know certainly like I say, in different little gaps in the fire, wetlands or whatever are going to influence the, the pattern of spread, and that's going to influence the fuel for the next fire. So if we could you know complete that feedback loop somehow, I think that would be particularly exciting you know going forward. As far as concerns, um, I mean, you know, one is, is just the how this information should be delivered to uh, fire practitioners. I'm a little concerned about just, you, you know, look, looking at the cool pictures and everything, but, you know, some managers, and maybe this isn't so much the case in, like, federal properties or something, but I know in the Red Hills, I've talked to managers who couldn't point themselves where we were on a map because the map was too too much of an abstraction of reality for them to understand, you know. But if we say, well, take a left at the at the rat barn and, you know, over by the big split pine tree, then they know exactly. And these are good fire managers. I mean, they know their stuff. They, they can put their finger in the wind and know what the fire is going to do. So, you know, for a certain audience, they just think that um, exposure to the model directly may not be the thing, but just developing products from the research of, you know, particularly informed managers and scientists working together, you know, like the people in this room, to come up with um, scenarios for particular environments, ecosystems, watch out situations, um, things that they need to be careful about, expectations for, and, and then, you know, just uh, guidelines for achieving particular management objectives. Uh, some of the things that I'd, you know, well, I guess it's getting on to the next page, so I'll stop there. I have some more questions about how the fuel agencies <coughs> are, are constructed and all, but I can catch up with Rod about that later and everything. But um, I'm, I'm really interested in its effects on uh, Crown Scorch, which is a, a huge management objective, like Carl was saying earlier. And uh, what visualization is most useful? I think how the air flows in the flaming zone is particularly informative. You know, thinking about fire behavior in terms of uh, the behavior of cool air as well as hot air, I think is a whole new world. You know, I mean, we're always thinking about what's, what's the heat doing, but that's only half of it. And really training people on what the other half is doing, I think would really increase understanding significantly. It's, it's, it's increased a lot for me. For sure. So, I mean, just I can't add a whole lot more than what's been said, but some things that I think about a lot um, and are reinforced with the model. You know, we're, we're a fairly short-lived species dealing with a very long-lived ecosystem, and our careers are even shorter, right? And um, we're impatient a lot of times. We want to see results. Um, and we really can't afford to repeat that cycle with every group of managers that comes in to learn the same things that you and I learned over 30 years to start over. So we need to continue to build and educate um, along the way. And this provides an opportunity uh, to, I, I think, enhance some learning and training. Uh, but I'm most excited about it as a, as a potential tool to develop some patient restoration strategies. You know, if, if this is the scenario that you've inherited, then you can do this, and you can do this, and you can do this, and here's the potential consequences of playing some what ifs, you know. Maybe we don't want to go ahead and go in here and do the grow one season burn in this particular block right now. Maybe we should go ahead and, and set it up for, you know, a dormant season burn first, 
maybe we should think about this type of ignition pattern, you know, ground ignition versus helicopter. Just being able to, to play some potential what if scenarios and understanding um, hardwood conditions that we've got. You know, I like uh, what Steve said about the flatwoods. I mean, that's, you know, there's a lot of flora that's like that. That's in bad shape and uh, it's going to be challenging to, to restore it. <clears throat> and, um, but in the other part of the country where I'm at, you know, we've got hardwood and sweet gum issues and, and it's affecting, you know, restoration objectives. You know, so what do we do? And should we mechanically remove some of this before fire? Should we burn it and be patient and just do two or three different types of fire? Should we do some herbicide control? So it's all part of trying to reach an objective of this desired future condition. And this model can help kind of inform a strategy, potential what ifs, on different scenarios to get to that uh, strategy. So, and then the other thing is, um, and it didn't really occur to me in, until later, uh, was, you know, maybe this would be a really good way to help the public understand uh, wildfire mm -hmm. um, consequences of you know fire spread and stuff. You know, I look at Florida and I look at these tremendously heavy fuel loads around wildland urban interfaces and slash pond mm -hmm. and stuff and and a visual tool for them to say, you know, here's where we live, here's our neighborhood, mm -hmm. and if we had one fire that started right here, and this is what would likely happen, mm -hmm. it would be like, whew, maybe that would be a potential yeah, tool. Yeah, it, it makes some very convincing yeah. visuals. It might be a good tool yeah. to advocate <clears throat> for more strive fire. It's showing what a well-managed system of fire is like compared to contrast. Right. And, and, and that's a that's a huge thing. I mean, I, I just see that in Florida. You know, I'm kind of in some ways glad I'm not here anymore. <laughs> of like, my God, this place is a time bomb in places. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of time uh, before we end up within the dry year. And, that's really, that's really And, and a California really situation is going to be occurring here in yeah. Florida. And uh, we're doing yeah. mm -hmm. so. David, do you have any comments from folks online? Or they've been shy. We had no comment from Bill, and uh, he's mostly he was echoing what Greg had to say, and then I think he's going to provide some additional comments. For you okay. Later. okay great. Well, th what I'd like to do next is uh, there have been several questions that have come up about topography, and fire brands, and some of those things, and Rob's got just a few slides before we go into the next uh, set of questions. Rob, if you want to, to go through those, I think that will so, kind of. Jewish people's imaginations up a little bit. So we'll, I'll, I'll throw these up here, and they were just ad hocly put together in response to some of the things that people were saying. I figure out how to put this back up here. Uh, David, look how I used to reactivate. Oh, okay. So um, we can go as fast or as slow as we want through these. <coughs> So let's you know, maybe pick out your best four or five. But definitely, I think it'll be interesting in the uh, fuels. So I will, try to, I will try to move through these pretty quickly. Okay, so this is, this is a, if they play, if they don't play. Then I think you have to point and click. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to just skip that one. Hmm. A goal. Mm -hmm. <coughs> James, why don't we skip and do the other because for some something's not something's not working. Why don't we go back and just start the next page and we'll come back to this? Okay. Technical difficulties. We don't want to waste time. All right. Well, you you work on that. Yeah. So let's go ahead and pull out your second page. Of some of you overachievers have already uh, <laughs> jumped in and, and finished it, but but that's okay. Um, now let's take a few minutes and, and go through the questions. And you know, point I made at the beginning of the, the workshop is, you know, we want to you know, get this information out to the practitioners, to the folks that are dragging the drift torches, to the burn bosses, to the firing bosses, you know, to those folks with more hair and less gray hair than, than what I have that are you know, going to be coming up and replacing us in the ranks. You know, really want to focus on what can we do to make future workshops better, but even broader than that, you know, what other ways can we 
use what we've done so far for improving training and with the resources that we have left in this grant, are there vector changes that you know, this group could suggest to make our efforts more effective? So just take out you know, five, maybe 10 minutes, and then we'll uh, come and run through these as well. Is graphics there? I think the slides are working. Okay, let's go ahead. We'll get the discussion going. Then we'll have time for these slides. Just people want to watch before lunch. So uh, we'll start. I'll start with you, Carl. Second page. Focused questions. Um, so uh, I talk about training. The first one, I guess, my comments were that the current model is still a little research focused. Managers need to be able to see potential consequences of this versus that, which we already talked a little bit about. Okay. What if type stuff. Uh, some terrain features for the second question, some terrain features which was already mentioned would be nice. Uh, also it was somewhat uh, atypical of the southeast given its soil and resulting field beds, tree heights, uh, tree density. Um, you know, and then the other point that was brought up about long leaf and slash pine flatwoods would be nice. Um, what products do you find most useful? Being able to predict outcomes, fire behavior, fire effects with different fuel loads. Um, uh, and then the last one, um, Eglin's unique in its ability to use ATVs, um, hand ignition, um, lighting roads, and aerial ignition pretty much are our choices that we've got. So, so yeah, something that 
slowing down emission patterns. So, you know, to a large percentage of the people who park service, for service, the ATV thing is like, yeah. yeah, we'll be lucky if we ever see that again. Carl, do you have access to py pyro shots and things that put kind of this irregular grid or irregular pattern of, of point source ignition inside a unit? Do we have one? Access to those pyro shots that yeah. put kind of an irregular point yeah. source, then that may be another scenario that you kind of... What does it do? It, it shoots the aerial ignition sphere into the unit, so it's not a grid, but you get like this irregular point source depending on how big the unit might be. Or you can use an air pistol. Yeah, that might be the paintball gun that shoots the paintball ball. Cool. 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 Question with <coughs> ATVs and hand lighters, it's just a change in rate of ignition. Right. So I'm trying to understand, maybe Rod could tell me. The phenomenology change? I mean, it would, I guess. Oh, yeah. The rate. Yeah. Like, yeah. Because. Well, especially like if you have those lines of fire burning. The relative, relative um, you know, phenomenology. The, the changes in weather throughout, you know, if you're doing it for a four hour time period instead of a 10 minute time period, there's going to be a lot of variation. In I, I think, I think so you would see differences even in the five line scenario if we just slowed our. So ATV ignition down to you know, two and a half miles an hour, and same with the dash ignitions. I, well, there would be a difference, I think, between ATVs and hand lighters, but there wouldn't be a difference, I don't think, in strip head versus dash versus point source. Do you know what I mean? As far as? The absolute difference in the rate of ignition would cause a phenomenology change, but the relative differences among ignition tactics Shouldn't. Yeah, but I think you're still going to see that dash ignition is going to produce less consumption than a straight line of action. I'm just wondering if what we already stretch. have is still going to be useful to somebody that's doing a hand ignition. And the, the other thing is in the terrain features that we have, we don't do you know, straight right. lines. I mean, a lot of times, I mean, these guys aren't going up and down. It's, they're 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 dropping off people lines. and they're like ridges. Right. They're like ridge tops, oh. and they're letting it come on down. And so that's a really you know, different thing for me. Yeah. A lot wider. Pretty much gained all my fire experience in Florida going up there. It's like, what? How are you doing? Yeah. And it's like, you it know, sounds like they may, you think they could be more creative with some of that too to create the effects that are desired. Yeah, to me, it's, it's just a, it seems like it's more about just getting in there to burn. You know, whereas I would look at an area and it's, and see that it was in this condition. I wanted to be in this condition, so I would think about how I would want to burn it to get to that condition. Whereas in our stuff, it's just we just need to burn this area. You can do the, a simulation of the ridge top burning, but then maybe one with some going mid slope or down slope. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There's some yeah. different scenarios. Yeah. Of course, the, the challenge is you get so many yeah. variables so quickly. You know, the aspect and how steep is the slope, how much elevation between the top and the bottom. Um, so yeah, but, you know, I think a, a, a really, we're always going to be wanting to burn, and so we can kind of try to figure out which way we're going to burn, but we're always going to have to, the, the need to burn, and so, and the smoke management stuff's going to continue to get worse and worse and worse, so we're going to have to be even better, so understanding the, the consequences of, you know, air ignition burning in this Ridge Valley system versus lighting these ridges and how that affects smoke and fire behavior and everything else. And then there's always risk too of trying to keep fires. You know, as the constraints for smoke get uh, more and more constrained, the number of burning days is going to get fewer. And so you're going to have to really be taking advantage of those burning days and sometimes people may want to push the envelope and, you know, may not understand the risk consequences of doing that. So keep it fire. Yeah. How about you, Kip? Well, as you talk, it, it makes me think of a demonstration I saw in which the person picked uh, randomly some spot in Florida and was able to enter the topography and uh, put down fire lines and doge lines and this, that, and the other. And you've probably all seen those in different formats of conferences or, or whatever. But, but I think those could be improved and, and one could include the sort of synthetic products that come out of the, of, of a, of the model uh, analysis uh, in terms of the, uh, of the uh, 
the different patterns and, and so forth that, that Biotech develops. Uh, so a, a better version of those of those models as an online tool seems to be something that might might gain interest. But uh, coming back to the question here, one thing that I uh, uh, that I, the, the little experience I have, the one one aspect of it is very patchy fields where you don't necessarily have continuous uh, continuous fire, and then and you have to go back in, reignite it by hand everywhere. Uh, and sometimes that happens, at least it seems to me, because the, the burn boss is not allowed to burn in the higher winds, which would not allow it to, to spread it better. Yeah. And so it's 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 it's, it's it's this question of what's of can you push the risk envelope in, in conditions and, and improve the ability of the manager to manage area with few people, low limited resources. Okay. Anything else? How the other stuff? Okay. Steve. So I think the ideal is what you guys already described is at some point either get the software dumped down to the point where it can run on a computer or bring wait for computers to catch up to do it. Because I think you know, having somebody able to run this with a coach in the room would be the ideal. In the meantime, I really think there's the potential for you and the, to use your big computer to build the little spreadsheets that show what happens if you tinker with ignition pattern or humidity or temperature. Run one or two of the videos so that because it kind of gives people confidence of how is it working as they see it go across the landscape. And then tell them they rent, that you rent, built the tables from running that and what percentage of time. Sort of like we did with land fire when we were doing the biophysical settings and it said if you, know, you run a whole bunch of simulations, 10% of it's gonna be too hot, 15% of it's gonna be scorched but not too hot and the rest of it will be just right kind of thing. Um, so that they can compare. But you want to do a couple of those videos because it, it really is telling about how things move, that it's not just a linear fashion across. Um, and I, things I would want you to be able to compare are changing sphere spacing versus line spacing, showing flanks versus heads. Um, and that's it. All right. I don't know much more either, but <clears throat> just hands on training. on training, are you talking about face-to-face? -face? Well, I think when I say hands-on, I mean, I may visualize a class, you know, they have the class right now for you know, really learn how to run all the models and lift us, and you go to a classroom, and you, you're there, and you run the models all the long, with right. instructors right. and coaches, and I mean, to me, that's like far, far way out. Right. Um, but, but now, I mean, in the earlier time, you can get it into the classes, at least in some of the when you're teaching fire cave, and when you're teaching fire, and you know, yeah, I, kind of, I, I want to try and figure out how to crack the nut with NWCG to try and get some of these visuals. Um, you know, and you mentioned the aerial ignition uh, scenarios and changing those. And that is something that we plan on doing because one of our objectives in the uh, project is to get information into the next iteration of the aerial ignition guide with some, some data. And uh, hopefully also for you know, the fire and loss training. Well, one of the things that the first thing you got to crack with the NWCG is there's still an awful lot of people running around here where the the, the motivation is to get it black so it'll never burn again. Um, and that's not our motivation. It's to maintain an ecosystem with a very specific kind of fire. So fire acres are not fire acres. Um, yeah, that, that's a good point. But I think still if we can get some of this message injected. There is more and more interest in the South's ability to get burning done. Well, they're talking the talk of cohesive strategy to not, this might be an opportunity to help them walk the walk. Right, and I, I, I definitely see that as a potential opportunity. It's a new tool, 
at least some new visuals to jazz up some pretty slow training. <laughs> in, in December, there was discussion of putting uh, some folks out of. There were some folks associated with NWCG that were talking about pushing to get stuff in on trainings and visualizations and so forth. It hasn't happened yet, but there there has been discussion about that at some level. But I, I am going to be working with PFTC. I was hoping they'd be able to make it. They've got a, a module in session. But yep. They'll go with PFTC and see if we can at least get it integrated into some of what they get, you know, the folks that come through there. We'd be hitting a lot of uh, key folks that way and getting some interest there that would then spread to the Western U.S. Got anything else, Steve? I want to compliment Carl. I have this thing that I call Steve's Parade Theory of Life that we learned from those people at the front of the parade and at some point in time we're supposed to focus on transferring knowledge to the people behind us in the parade. But I really love that short-lived species managing a long-lived ecosystem <laughs> with even a shorter career. I, may I use that? Yep. <laughs> Since ATVs aren't an option, those places just have it, you know, with the walker. Or just, just most people yeah, just whatever it is. Down. You know, I know like at St. Mark's, you know, they put dog collars on the vests when they're walking through so they can track yeah. where mm -hmm. the people actually walk with the drift flippers, you know, by GPS. Mm -hmm. I don't think they shock or anything. Sometimes it'd be useful. They put it on their vest, you know. So, <laughs> so they do the same thing with the helicopter. They'll put it up in the... Yeah. Right. Or something here. Well, yeah, and in a helicopter, you know, they're going to have a GPS anyway to track the yeah. track the, You know, just doing an actual pattern, and then you know somehow you know you've got some thermal images on there from an aerial mission. You know, I know it's asking a lot, but if you could somehow correlate that, you know, the actual burn and then plug the actual stuff into the model and compare what actually happened versus what the model shows. Yeah, and you know, we did some comparison with the uh, grass strip of simple ignition mm -hmm. you know, with RX Cadre, but you know, the, having the data for actual validation is is tough because there, there's so many variables and they're all on a sliding scale. You know, visually, your know, things can be pretty striking and, and pass the sniff test, but uh, that, that is an interesting thought though about actually tracking in a place where you've got good data on the fuels. Mm -hmm track people as they go through and burn, see what the model does, and compare it to you know, aerial analysis afterwards, something like that. Uh, I think that would help with the, with the buy-in one. Yeah. Any, anything else, John? Um, I'm not really that hasn't been covered. You know, just, yeah, John, do you guys use four-wheelers still? Yeah, we, we burn about an hour and one a year, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it is a skill. Yeah, but it, it's, you know, it's, just they, you know, the seven mile an hour on an ATV is pretty optimistic. Uh, pretty sporty. Yeah, especially going. <laughs> we place that on Carl. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's it's very same. They get 
Brian Sanders on the phone for they try and run over the log, you green sand or oak sap, and think they can push over. And, the usual climb. Yeah, you know, ends up climbing up. And, 26 years of using horses for ignition, we have never burned up or injured a horse. <laughs> can you do seven miles away? No. <laughs> or just dump us a horse. But yeah, we, we, we do say you babies. Good. Not a whole lot more to, to add. Up. You know, something that you're already doing as far as delivery methods and all that, you know, doing just getting the message out more to, to, to folks, you know, tying in with fire running networks, you may really be doing that. <coughs> we have a bit directly, yeah, we have presented it to describe our councils mm -hmm. some of the earlier scenarios, but it'd be good to do that yeah, again. Yeah, and just, you know, kind of to go to neighboring states too, you know, and, um, and and then another thing that's kind of thrown in my mind is new technology. You know, we've got drone technology right around the corner, and we're going to be utilizing that, I think, as far as dropping balls and you know, being able to maybe, you know, you can utilize that to create some of your uh, different intensity levels, you know, when you're talking about like in the, in the terrain, instead of just igniting that ridge top, you know, you can go down and blow those holes or whatever. Yeah. In, in the park service, it's a lot different because we're not too worried about trying to maintain um, the canopy and right. timber, you know, we, we want that diversity in, in all the even age stuff that we have, you know, so to, to be able to do that and get that technology and be able to see those different scenarios with few blow holes and, or make some changes, I think would be really helpful. Um, and then I really like what Carl was talking about, you know, a lot of this for that manager is, you know, creating more and more of those visual scenarios that, that we've talked about and, and to have those online or whatever. Um, one other thing as far as that I, I would find useful, and, and, I, and we kind of touched about it, is just finding that age class, um, you know, different age classes of the community types or trees, and then um, being able to have some kind of an estimator of mortality so if you're creating snags, again, I, on my end, I have a, a huge, you guys got work by K woodpeckers, I've got like Indiana bats and, and the whole bat gambit that I've got to manage. And so, you know, if I know, if I can prove to my management that, you know, you let me burn, I'm going to create more bat habitat. If you don't let me burn, you know, that, that's going to be more marketable on my end to be able to, to, to show that, you know, something like that is a, a, a benefit. So, I don't know. Where you can get some kind of a tag. Um, and then, yeah, the, the other one we talked about is just in, you know, in, the, in that mountain scenario, if we're, if we're using an ignition pattern on the ridge top, you know, we have to spread that out to be able to see those, those different intensity levels based on a ridge versus a, a series strips or dots, which we don't use in the mountains. Well, some people have, I guess, in the past, and not been very positive about them, so that was the things I need to How far does the, uh, whatever you were talking about, that uh, gun that shoots the spears, how far does it shoot? It, it varies um, if you hit a tree or not. But, <laughs> yeah, especially if you have close to the line. Uh, but it, you know, the, the bearing pistol can shoot, you know, 200 feet or so. In. So you can always yeah. shoot off of a ridge. Yeah. yeah and you if can you shoot it down. If you don't want to put people down there. Mm -hmm. okay. Hey, James, one, one thing listening to Jennifer and listening to Carl, when you're trying to convince people that the fuels and the system has changed, one of the things I like to do is show people the evolution of fire suppression equipment. In the 40s, we could put out a fire with a tractor plow behind, I mean a plow behind a Dodge Power Wagon. And then we went to little bulldozers, and then we went to TD9s, and then we were at John Deere 450s, and then we were at 550s. Now we're running 650s. It's not because we want bigger and more expensive equipment, it's because the vegetation we got to work through is that much bigger. Yeah. Even if we're talking about 747s, they're doing that on the target. Yep. It's like the planes, they every year in the pressures out there in California, mm -hmm. they show you know, the seat, 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 the seat,
that's what that's what's going on. Yep. And it's not putting a dent on it. I mean, it's not very effective. It looks good on TV. Yeah. 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 So, well, well, David, you've been quietly sitting over there for this entire time. Have you got any comments or? Um, I know that from the times that I've seen this presented in prescribed fire council meetings and then uh, we've mentioned fire tech at workshops and presentations uh, at prescribed fire council and other events, you know, the question of validation always comes up. Um, and I think that somehow more quantitative validation will help get more buy-in and acceptance of it. Because um, it, it doesn't take long for that question to come up. With um, and that's and it, something that Kevin promises he's going to be able to do for us. Through I understand the spatial it's, a challenge, it's a challenge, but it's, it's also the challenge for acceptance. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, We've run into that a lot. And then in terms of additional uh, simulations, the, I think we've hit on most of them, but for sure flatwoods, something with more volatile underscore fuel, like high palmetto, gallberry, that kind of thing. Just yeah, because. A little bit of background might be helpful. I mean, obviously we had the, the data sets for Eglin, and we had the RX Cadre at Eglin, but also you know, Longleaf Pine Conservation is a very high priority for Department of Defense because they hold a lot of the last best Longleaf Pine Forest and so that's what got the grant funded was that you know, focus on Longleaf Pine Forest. And so you know, that little bit of history, if, if it had been in you know, Slash Pine Flatwoods or the you know, Hardwood Hills, probably wouldn't have gotten money to get done what we've gotten done. But you know, there's potential opportunity for you know, grants in the future to address some of these other questions that we have coming up. That's why it's been really important and I really appreciate everybody's input uh, as we work through this. And uh, what I'd like to, have you got your stuff ready, Ron? Is it going to work? So while, while he's doing that, I mean, this America's long life, you know, objective to get 8 million acres planted on a lot of it is understanding what was long leaf flatwoods is now right. slash flatwoods. Well, a lot of flatwoods that they're so I think, I think you can make a tie. Yeah. I think you can make a strong tie. That, you know, we're dealing with two different types of long leaf systems. So yeah, and that's, system and the that's, that's really true. And, you know, surpass is involved up to their, their neck. And you know, well, a lot of what they're doing is uh, slowly, slow conversion slash right. long leaf, and that creates some interesting wind fields in there when you take you know, a third row thinning or fifth row thinning on slash long and plant long leaf in the road. What frustrates me is that there seems to be this. Mm -hmm. Emphasis on establishing new acres of longleaf without understanding that we've got a lot of it that's impaired uh, and, and um, needs to be improved. Uh, that still has you know ground cover associated with it, and rare species associated with it. Instead of going into an ag field and plant longleaf and trying to claim new acres of longleaf, well, we need to do both. Don't get me wrong, but. You know, right, it's not the longleaf itself, it's the longleaf ecosystem. Right, exactly. and most of that is in the ground cover. Right. And that's so if you got a choice between spending a dollar on turning an ag field and plant a longleaf, or spending a dollar recovering an old slash pine plantation that's got the intact ground cover. Yeah. yeah. And, and what's cover. worse is if we take <clears throat> precious resources, which are limited, and expend them on trying to plant longleaf and allow these impaired areas where species are just barely hanging on. To continue to degrade, then we've lost things. I mean, you know, first, first rule of medicine: do no harm. You know, yeah. we can't allow any more harm while we do some restoration. So, yeah. well, uh, I think Rod's got his <coughs> slides work. So, let me show you a few more things that illustrate. So apparently, so we have six, six here. or seven powerpoints on this side open, <coughs> open at a time. Nothing works. So, that was what was wrong before. Uh, so this is actually, this is a simulation we discussed a little while ago. Um, this is an aerial ignition that you've already seen. Um, and this is the wind field at two and a half meters above the ground in this simulation. And unfortunately, we didn't realize that they're not running at exactly the same speed. So, um, so the black here is indicating where things are, are actively burning. 
the wind, there's wind vectors everywhere, but when they're really small, you can't see them. Look at the channeling. So, the so the green is horizontal winds down at two and a half meters above the ground. But the really important thing to look at here, and I'll back it up and come at it one more time, is just the, and again, they're not time synced, they're not running at the same pace, so I apologize. Um, but this is the scenario where the wind is coming from this way, and you can see upwind of the fire, there's little gusts and bursts that get down in there. Every once in a while you see a little green blob of air that's moving rapidly in there. But downstream of the burn, downstream of where the fire is, when you start removing that dry, that mid-story drag, you get all this airflow. Whereas in a wildfire, it's reversed. Right. And you get you get that inflow, that air that's getting down in and helping drive the fire forward. And I think being able to look at that and think about it, as well as what are the effects of the roads? What are the effects of brakes that are in there in channeling winds? Is certainly of an interesting thing. Uh, so we talked about a topography a little bit, but we also talked about fire burns. There was a simulation run a little while back, um, looking at there's a critical facility at Los Alamos that sits out in here, and there were questions about what is the influence of topography on the fire spread, <laughs> and um, slowing down, and and also the spire. So. In this case, I'm not sure if you can see in the back, but there's a lot of blue dots. Those are the airborne firebrands. White, white dots that are showing up are firebrands that have landed. And so we don't have new fire starts, but we're looking at areas of accumulation of firebrands. And one thing you can look at is say, how does the topography and the shape of this canyon, for instance, influence the launching and the deposition of those firebrands? And how might you? So the difference between these two simulations is that there was thinning in the bottom of the canyon, or thinning slash the surface fuels were were burned or removed in the bottom of the canyon. So it was an exploration. We've talked about convective cooling and so forth, and so in this simulation, which was in Ponderosa Pine. The, uh, the colors here are indicating convective heating and cooling. So if you're heating the fuel with the hot air, it's red. If you're cooling fuel that was already hot, it's blue. So the, the ability for a, the, the, one of the controlling factors for singeing or consumption of the canopy in this case is how efficiently can you get that cooling air in behind the fire? So one of the things to point out here is this band of trees that survives. A, it's really close to where it was ignited, but B, you're also able to entrain lots of cool air to cool that, uh, that area off. And so a lot of times you'll see that on the edge of a forest, that first row of trees that, that survives when everything in the interior got, got uh, kind of beaten up. So we've talked about validation, and validation is a messy game um, and it's even messier in the prescribed fire slash low intensity world here was a here are simulations of the international crown fire modeling experiment that was performed in in uh, canada in uh, spruce and jack pine forest really high intensity crown fire and one of the things, to, and one would think, oh, that should be really hard. Well, when a fire is creating its own, dominating its own environment, it's actually easier to capture with a physics-based model because the gusts and small changes in the fuels or winds don't affect the fire as much. It's a lot more resilient to its own behavior. So in this case, it was within 10% of, <coughs> of the actual spread rates and things. There were some things about this fire that were really educational. So this is looking down, the color scheme is green is horizontal winds, reds and yellows are rising winds, blues are falling winds. And so like this alternating yellow-blue pattern here, means you've got swirling winds, right? Rising and falling, rising and falling. So you've got these 
helixes that are showing up here. As the fire burns, you see this entrainment pattern. And just to, just to remind you, this was a block that was intended to take empirical measurements to come up with a spread rate curve. So they call these blocks in the landscape, and I'll come back at it up there on the on the <coughs> right. They cut all these blocks in the landscape, and the intention was to burn these under different environments. So this block, and they light with a terror torch. This block has its own. Uh, the design here actually affects the fire spread <laughs> because the design allows these in these cuts for the air to flow in and around and changes the back, back flow coming into the back of the fire. And so one of the things we learned out is these simulations, well, we can put the trees back in, right? In a simulation, you take the trees out to create the cuts, you can put them back in and explore, well, what was the effect of the experimental design, which is pretty cool. Um, so, but in this case, validation was okay here. It turns out when we've tried to do validation on low intensity fires, it's really subject to the fluctuations in the wind. So you have to be really careful to measure those winds, uh, super carefully. So here's a little bit more on topography. Again, I was just grabbing slides to demonstrate some of the things we talked about earlier. So this is actually a far sight. Um, and I'm hoping that, it, yeah, I'm okay. So this is the far sight. This is part of the Calabasas fire that burned in Southern California in 1996, Corral Canyon. Basically, uh, it's by Malibu. The ocean's here, and it spotted up into the bottom of this canyon, and then grew out of the, and the reason that Los Angeles County was really interested in this was because it burned up houses here and hurt some firefighters. It jumped the road here. There were, there were fire trucks caught on the road. So there was a lot of interest. That's, that's a fire, fire site simulation where you had one hour, two hours, and three hours to get to just about where those houses were. And, and this wasn't what they observed. So this is a fuels map that was collected or taken from IR uh, overflights done by the University of California, Santa Barbara. You've got effectively a whole bunch of chaparral, different species, and what they called unburnable, which included houses. Uh, <laughs> sort of unburnable, but it also included roads. And when you put it on the, when you run the simulation, Simulation didn't get it exactly right. Okay, simulation ran up. Here's where the folks were hurt. Here's where the where it was getting to the road. But it ran up that canyon, which was not quite right. Um, if we look back at the uh, fire spot, you can see where it kind of topped out in that canyon, and so that wasn't quite right. Um, so. Didn't jump the road either. Right. Uh, right. Right. And so we went back to um, the National Park Service had a riparian zone. It's not water, but it is a riparian zone, which isn't necessarily wet, but it has bigger fuel because it's occasionally wet. So these are these are oak trees and things like that in the bottom of the canyon, which inherently is more fuel uh, down in the canyon, which one would think, well, that will just make the fire go, go faster. The problem, will, the problem in, the, in the simulations we've done is it went too fast, and it just ran that canyon. Well, how is adding more fuel going to possibly help us here? Well, you put in more fuel in the bottom of the canyon, so you can see the riparian zone now at the bottom of the canyon. First of all, it slows the fire progression down down the bottom of the canyon because you don't get the same wind penetration. And then when it comes out of that canyon, it still runs up, burns, burns the folks at the top of the, of the hill there, still get some of the same behaviors, but it's moving at a slower rate. 
But the other thing that the fuel at the bottom of the canyon does, it does burn, but the aerodynamic drag changes the rate at which it burns. So now you don't get that funneling into the bottom of the canyon that just drives it up. And so it actually kind of kind of tops out up here and it keeps burning down in, but it, it tops out. So um, so this was the comparison without the riparian, with the riparian zone. So you can see that the top two panels here, if I have my mouse, this is 12 minutes, this is 18 minutes. Um, so it's just about to burn the burn over those houses at 12 minutes. Down here, it's between 18 and 24 minutes when it burned over those houses. The documented time is 20 to 25 minutes. For it to, for it, from the time they noticed the spot at the bottom of the canyon until when it burned over the burned over the phone. So it's it's in the ballpark. Given <laughs> given all the uncertainties, etc. It's, it's not too bad. Um, so coming back to I think Kevin's point, um, this is the, this is, these are contours of fire progression from the, the Los Conscious fire, the burning of the Los Alamos. And uh, in 2011, and if I could find my mouse, it's disappeared again. Um, so Los Alamos National Lab, where I work, is just approximately here. Fire started here around 1 p.m., propagated, wind-driven through the afternoon, got to, and these were perimeters based on airborne attack. There was no data at that point. Got out to where the orange perimeter was approximately around 8 p.m. or so, or 7 p.m., sorry. and. At that point, it was 8,000 acres. They expected 9 to 12,000 acres by morning. The topography says that this is, well, this is a volcano. And so this is downhill. And so the perception was it's going downhill. It's the winds were going to die off overnight. And it was going from mixed conifer and ponderosa pine to pinyon juniper which looks kind of like that. And if you can't see that in the back of the room, these are pinion or juniper um, bushes or trees with rocks in between. No one expected that to even carry fire. Um, so by th the, the unexpected event though was that at 3 a.m. the same night, the red perimeter shows up, 43,000 acres. And the, the, the ambient atmosphere had acted just the way they expected it to. Why, you know, so there's lots of whys. So some combination of mountain waves or downslope, nocturnal flows, etc., drove this behavior, which was unexpected, in topography. One hypothesis was a column collapse or partial column collapse which goes back to Kevin's comment about a, something like a thunderstorm or a sea breeze right so when a column if a column collapses or when you have a thunderstorm outflow you get this density current that rolls across the ground um, this is a simulation of a of a uh, outflow or a, or a column collapse so here we have a density current it's like a sea breeze or a thunderstorm outflow rolling across the ground, hitting a fire. That's a 2D slice of this 3D fire. But then the interesting thing is what feedbacks are really showing up? You have an accelerated wind. That's fine. We can, we can understand that accelerated winds are going to push the fire a little faster. But in this case, this rotation that shows up that exists right here, has an additional feedback in the presence of the fire because it does basically does this and the effect is this downward motion of the air that you can see right here drives the winds not only horizontal faster but pushes them down and so you're you're amplifying that feedback from the fire down to the surface and pushing it 
pushing, amplifying the heating of the of the surface fuels in front of the fire. So exploring things like Kevin said about you know how how would a sea breeze interact with you know prescribed fire? How would a sea breeze interact with fire? In general, certainly and Rod, we've all seen that where, where gusts on the sea, sea breeze front might be twice what the actual front itself is moving inland at. You know, so maybe you got a, a gust, a sea breeze front moving inland at, at 10 to 15 miles an hour, but your gusts are 40. You know, right. on individual gusts, and it's that, that, that turbulent feedback. Right, so that rotor yeah. that sets up on the front edge. Uh, kind of a backspin, if you want to think of it that way. Um, so another thing that was odd about this fire that was kind of unexpected, at least to the folks I was talking about, was these fingers that sit out here at the front of this fire, they're all the bottom of these steep canyons. They're not on the ridge lines. They're not up above. And, uh, and yet, and they're burning through these kinds of fuels, and yet out on these mesa tops, you have nothing left than four, nothing less than four inches left when it's all done. No one expected that to even carry fire, but you're down to just big stuff on this pinion juniper. So the question is, why is it burning over those mesas at all? And I'll, I'll, you'll, it'll become apparent why I almost cared about this. <laughs> um, we had James come out and review some of this work. Uh, so the concept that we had to explore is what happens when you're firing two parallel canyons like let's say those two parallel canyons and so when you have fire in two parallel canyons you get this non-local effect of the interaction between two plumes interaction between two fires where you get an imbalance in your entrainment and therefore they want to draw together I mean this is the oversized version of a prescribed fire behavior that you're hoping is happening underneath the trees but when it does this uh, you get a you get a much intensified behavior on top of the mesa top. So we thought, well, we'll just play some experimental games. We'll look at we'll put a fire here and a fire here under low wind and high winds, low wind and moderate wind scenarios, and look at what happens. So climbs up, gets to the top, but we put this little patch of trees out here. So there's a clearing, and you'll understand the clearing in a minute. This is a clearing. Put a little patch of trees here because that was a nice indicator hmm. and said what happens well it, it goes up the hill okay that's not unexpected but it doesn't just cream the the indicator of trees right well that's not what we were what not what we anticipated so we made one change we closed this end right upwind fire over the mesa top Simply by closing that end, you completely change the fire coming over that mesa top, and our indicator trees uh, didn't fare so well. So think about not just how does the local fire configuration, but an upstream fire configuration change the entrainment and the following of, of fuel. This is why we care. Los Alamos has a lot of these configurations sitting, uh, sitting on its property, and for instance, that facility is of high value and contains some materials that we really don't want burned over. <laughs> and there is zero, zero tolerance for risk in this scenario. So by doing this and taking all the heat transfer to that facility in this catastrophic worst case scenario, basis, looking at the heat transfer to that facility, and then looking at the heat transfer through all the containment, we could understand what, what risk we were putting in the materials that sit in that, in that building. So last one. So we started looking at very simple fire scenarios. Um, grass, homogeneous grass, flat ground. Um, these two fires are burning in the same winds, same fuels. The only difference between the two simulations is the length of the line that was, that was ignited. 
And if you think about what are the operational tools telling us currently, if you have the same fuels, same winds, same moisture levels, your fire should burn at the same spread rate. But the simulation suggests that the length of the line impacts the spread rate. And you guys know that right. So here's a picture where three fires were lit at the same time and you get different behaviors. So it's not just an artifact of the model, but the question is in the model, what drives the difference in spread rate? And it comes back to, I'm not sure who said it, but the idea of flanking fires. What is the, what is the impact of flanking fires? Here is 400 meter long fire line to start with, and that was a 100 meter long fire line. And they're spreading at different spread rates. So the colors are pressure. You have a high pressure, low pressure going across the, you know, from front to back on the fire, across the fire line. That's what draws air through the fire line. That's what drives that power trough behavior and moves energy to the unburned fuels down, down with. The white lines are airflow that's coming into the back of the fire. And so these are, these are sort of like streamlines. So when a stream, it's like a river. So when a river gets narrow, you can think of the pace of the river accelerates. And then a wind widens out, it slows down. Same thing with these streamlines. So it's coming in, it's getting wider here because some of the air is getting lifted. But as it comes in, one of the things that happens in the short fire line is the flanks start to draw air and draw up and out. So the flanks are competing with the head for that inflow. So by having the flanks so close together, I get less pressure across that head fire line, less move of air through those gaps in the fingers, less heat transfer to the unburned fuel, and thus less movement. Effectively, we get less of, a, less of an ambient wind in the head fire pit. Whereas when our flanks are far apart, we get lots of air penetration that just goes right into the head and pushes it forward. Now, of course, this, this depends heavily on what's the bulk density of the surface fuels. For a higher bulk density, this, in, this uplift is going to be stronger. And so there's going to be a lot of sensitivity. It's not a one-size-fits-all rule. For very thin fuels, you might have less of this effect because your flanking fibers don't persist as well. But doing those explorations is is something that's certainly possible. Yeah. So wouldn't that scenario kind of explain with aerial ignition more uh, a dense pattern of ping pong balls resulting in less fire intensity? Because you'd be simulating what's on the right, right? It'd be closer together, they'd be smaller. It's as opposed to that. rates of spread. Mm -hmm. You would have I mean intensity too, because you've got yeah single points and they're doing just exactly what that's doing as opposed to a line of fire which is more yes. so I think the, the flip yeah. side and I think I think if you think of it in terms of gaps for entrained cool air it's kind of like closing the flank right when you close the flank you actually do this and you change that behavior but but I, but I think you're exactly right Rod, uh, yeah. with respect to flank and fire dynamics and, and you know rates of spread, you know, we always tend to fight both flanks. But if you're if if entrainment is slowing down the head fire by fighting two flanks at once, anchored right. in on the back, we're actually allowing that fire to potentially spread faster right. than were we to be just taking away one flank. I mean, really interesting. I mean, our basic firefighting techniques may accelerate the spread of fire we're trying to, to extinguish in, uh, yep. in certain scenarios. I mean, that's, yeah, it's like if you could magically put fire on the line in the black, I don't know how to do that, but if you could magically pull lines back here in the black to pull that ambient wind, that would be, that would be great. I don't know how you do that, well, but, the, but well, the flanking fire would serve that purpose. I'll, I'll describe that. That scenario plays out in every fire plan that, that, I, that I, I, I read or reviewed. 
when people say if a spot fire is found, we're going to stop ignition. Well, the spot fire is, is downwind of your ignition line, and if you stop ignition, that spot fire could it's spread faster. Yep. Right. You know, and, and I always used to strike that out just because I, I didn't like the I didn't like you having to do anything on fire. <laughs> but uh, you know, I don't like the flexibility. But you know, the fact is, if you got a buoyant plume that you're working on, and you have a couple of spots, that buoyant plume upwind from your prescribed fire is going to slow down that spot fire. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that's actually a really good point. But yeah, it's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. Now, if you got twenty or thirty spots, you might want to stop ignition. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. So, from a management implication standpoint, you're saying that by stopping the, the prescribed fire, it exasperates the impacts of the of the spot fire. It, it, so you yeah, need to kind of do kind of do try not to go overboard with stopping the fire, right? right. But deal with the spot fire. You're not you're not saying that the spot fire go. I mean, obviously, correct, but, correct. But right. the implications of shutting down the burn right. amplify you, the effects of the spot fire. If Absolutely. you lose that buoyant lift from the active prescribed fire, and then all of a sudden, all you've got the vacuum fire, and you've got all this open space with burning fuel, and then you yeah. get to do it. That's a really, really good point that well, we need to kind of really think hard about, because I think that's a standard you know, mm -hmm. protocol for most fire plans. You know, this happens, then we're going to do this, yeah. without understanding the consequences of it. Well, probably right. distance of the spot has something to do with it, too. I mean, some, oh, some sure. distance is going to be... Well, and, and, and I mean, so th this might be one of those next steps. You know, the, the project was to look at prescribed fire planning, but, you know, when we think about suppression and even prescribed fire, Tactics, you know, that may be something, Carl, we can we can talk about with the regional office. You know, if, if there is an extension of this to understand how how our standard tactics affect potential fire behavior. Again, it's not you know just as a as a, a tool suite. And as Brett said, if you're right across the fire line, that spot fire you know may not go anywhere because it's one pull back into your your, your prescribed fire. But if you're 150 yards away. Some depending on the there. length of line and the intensity, that, that's the kind of stuff that we can start to explore. But right. uh, firefighters got to be thinking about all of those things, and right now we don't. We just we just say, hey, spot fire, stop ignition because the burn plan says. Yeah. That and the and the firefighting tactics on the two fronts, the two yes. flanks, is something that really needs to be explored too, because that has huge implications on well, the especially fast moving fuels. Yeah, and then you know the model could be applied to fire suppression tactics. You know, if we've got this fire around here and we you know, backfire along here, what does that do to the fire? You know, how does that affect it? How many times have we all seen, you know, the counter fire? Yeah. You know, that's yeah, how how much fire is enough, right? I mean, do you do you light by anchoring in or do you run up in front and just get you a little bit of fire going? I, you know, the counter fire scenario is what burned up Los Alamos and Sarah Ronda. Yeah. And and it went too know, far down. Right. And, and so, uh, you know, there's this really interesting tactics, op and we've discussed this, and we've tried to do some counter fire, and, and you know, backing fire and flanking fire, you know, are really difficult to capture at a two meter scale, uh, you know, within even fire tech. But these are the kind of that's the frontier, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that would be a potential future use or something like that. Yeah. You know, no. just for doing sand table type thing or for wildfire type. And the flanking fire thing that you're bringing up. You know, it gets back to what um, Steve said about the equipment. You know, it might have been back in the day, you know, when the fuels were much different, vegetation was much different, the consequences of dealing with both sides of the flame, maybe it wasn't that big a deal. But as the fuels change, vegetation changes, fire behavior's changing, we need to rethink tactics mm -hmm. based on what the models tell us with winds and fire behavior and fire effects and all that. But, you know, right. things are different. Yeah, if you got so they need a different approach. That's that's all.